Good morning everyone who's joining us here at the Investment Centre in Melbourne and good morning, good afternoon and good evening to all of those that are joining us online because we are streaming across to multiple locations including the study hubs in some locations which I assume will come online as morning arrives over there because it'd be a big commitment in uh, Singapore and Ho Chi Minh City and so forth to be here this morning. Um, I'm David Linky, the Managing Director of Edugrowth. We are Australia's EdTech ecosystem hub and through connection and collaboration, we are focused on accelerating Australia's edtech ecosystem around the world. I'm excited to be here with you today, as this is the culmination celebration of many years and including a really intense year of work for nine sprint projects. I'd like to congratulate each of the sprint teams, their education partners, research mentors, and all of the learners involved over that journey. It's important that I thank um, the institutions, Global Victoria, Deakin University, Monash University, and the entire Edgegrowth team who have pulled this program together and supporting it and supporting all of the teams to achieve some success as well. Before I begin, I'd like to take a moment to pay our respects to Australia's First Nations people. In the spirit of reconciliation, we acknowledge traditional custodians of the country throughout Australia and their connections to land, sea, community and culture. We respectfully acknowledge the Wurundjeri people of the Kulin Nations who are the traditional owners of the land here in Melbourne and I extend all our respects to the elders past, present and emerging um, and to all Aboriginal and Torres Strait, uh, uh, Torres Strait peoples joining us today in the room and also online. It's with um, my great pleasure that I welcome Treasurer Tim Pallas, the Treasurer of Victoria, Minister for Economic Development, Minister for Industrial Relations and importantly today, Minister for Trade to officially open our morning. Well, thanks very much, David, and it gives me great pleasure to be here today to uh, uh, acknowledge the enormous work that's being done in this field of endeavour. I too, however, would like to join with you at the outset to acknowledge the traditional owners of the land on which we meet and to recognise that 65,000 years of the longest continuous culture on the planet is one that deserves recognition, uh, one that deserves uh, truth, treaty and voice. Um, I'd also, uh, of course, like to acknowledge uh, David uh, Linky, the Managing Director of EduGrowth, to all the CEOs of the Victorian EduTech co companies that are here in the room and perhaps watching uh, with us remotely, lead researchers on projects, to international project partners who may be attending remotely, and of course the team from Global Vic who do a great job in identifying opportunities and extending our uh, reach into education and particularly education technology companies. So it's great to be here with uh, the state's leading education technology companies. Um, I think it's uh, opposite that we've been through quite a, uh, quite a, a, a substantial event, uh, a life-changing event and an industry-defining event. Uh, such as a pandemic, but one that in many ways has uh, brought out um, uh, the need for reform, uh, for efficiency and for uh, a fleet of foot movement in a time when education was at uh, some of its most uh, defining moments. Uh, a, a moment that can define whether or not we go forward or fall backwards. And, uh, to all of those in this sector who have demonstrated a willingness to adjust and adapt uh, to very difficult circumstances, I want to pay my respects and uh, the appreciation of the state for your willingness to provide us with the tools and the capacity to engage. And also uh, to recognise that we can't go backwards simply because it looks like the pandemic event is now slowly abating in terms of its challenges to the community. We have to take some learnings out of this and we have to be prepared uh, to continue to adapt to the changing circumstances. Um, Victoria is proudly the education state, but it's not just a licence plate. Um, it uh, uh, should be part and parcel of everything we do as a community. When you think about this state, um, uh, we don't have the natural resources that uh, other states do. Uh, but we have an economy that's performing about 50% faster uh, in terms of growth than the rest of the country. And you ask yourself, well, why is that? 
it's largely because we've invested in our people. Um, we have the highest level of educational attainment of any state in the nation uh, post-secondary uh, uh, school. Uh, and once again, that is because we continue to invest in our people but recognise that the critically, the most important way to do that, to demonstrate it uh, and to manifest our material uh, advancement is to recognise that our people are our greatest asset and education is the greatest enabler of, of the Victorian people. So prior to the pandemic, the global uh, edutech uh, sector was already an, on a, an impressive growth trajectory, about $7 billion worth of venture capital investments in 2019. The global pandemic really did highlight uh, the need for quality education delivered across distances and Victorian companies and education providers answered the call and uh, demonstrated in a very material way that we were capable of uh, continuing the processes of education, albeit the challenges that it confronted. Uh, educators, uh, might I say uh, families as well, uh, during the course of the pandemic. The global pandemic, I think, really uh, demonstrated that Victorian companies and educators uh, needed to be fleet of foot and needed to demonstrate that they could produce uh, quality products that would enable that connection both into schools and uh, uh, students that enable them the opportunity to continue their contributions uh, and their educational journey. And as a parent, I can tell you, I've been a proud recipient of uh, watching my daughter study remotely and continue with her education um, uh, courses. Um, I think uh, Victoria obviously um, is proud of its role in the edutech uh, said sector. About one third of Victoria's edtech or the nation's edtech companies supporting about 4,200 jobs in uh, 2021 and it contributes an estimated $726 million uh, to our annual revenue uh, uh, to the economy of the state. So fast growing and a substantial contributor. Our global reputation in education excellence uh, and innovation teaching and learning delivery puts us in a strong position really to lead the sector's growth now and into the future. But we can't simply take our position for granted and we have to constantly look at ways that uh, we can form the partnerships that enable this sector to grow and to prosper. And that uh, not only requires us to think about what we can do as a state to facilitate the growth and opportunities, but how we can uh, use collaborations in this industry to recognise that there is more that we can do. The Global Victorian EdTech Innovation Alliance, I think, is one example of how uh, the Victorian Government is backing the sector's growth. The program brought Victoria's EdTech companies together with 27 education partners, 165 educators and more than 4,000 learners across 13 companies to test locally, develop solutions for local and international markets. Quite frankly, the results were nothing short of impressive. And today, we're looking forward to hearing from those leading companies, their experiences, their learnings, so that we can uh, continue to innovate and grow. The program helped Kahoot to uh, expand its presence into Latin America and Mentor Match and uh, Intel Intelli Schools have both gone on to secure significant investments to expand. Kahoot, Mass Pathways, Versco and Ziplet have also received a rating of 92% or higher according to Education Alliance Finland's assessment, um, which prove that their learning solutions are of value to customers. So really in conclusion, bringing together edtech companies with educators and learners a vital to innovation and innovation uh, leads to growth and sustainability right across this sector. Uh, I commend the partnerships and the work that the Alliance has nurtured so far, particularly uh, 
what you're doing to boost Victoria's status as the education state. Uh, your contribution, your investment and your vision for the future are vitally important. The alliances that you forged today and you have done to d get us to this point uh, has assisted both in terms of the comparative size of the industry in this state but the contribution that this industry can make to learning both nationally and internationally is vitally important. Thinking about new partnerships, new alliances and new ways of engaging uh, students, uh, engaging educators so that they can have the opportunities to enhance the educational experience I think is vitally important. We recognise that education in this state is not only part and parcel of enabling and empowering the next generation, but it's also a vital part of our economy and the opportunities that we can present to the world as a, uh, as a credible player in this space. So I look forward to seeing more successes uh, as a result of your incredible work. I thank you for your investment, your vision and your continuing commitment uh, to uh, the growth of this vital industry. Thanks very much. I understand the Treasurer has an incredibly um, in busy day today, so we join me again in thanking the Treasurer for his time this morning, and I think you move on to another meeting. Thank you very much. Um, the Global Victoria EdTech Innovation Alliance is a really big program. Uh, with a huge range of stakeholders. We've put together a video that outlines the program and the key learnings, but I've lost screens. Oh, here we go. The Global Victoria EdTech Innovation Alliance is a funded initiative under the International Education Short-Term Recovery Plan. Victoria has an exciting and diverse range of EdTech companies excelling in global education solutions. Victoria is home to world-class education institutions, Australia's largest cohort of online program management companies and is a major innovation and digital technology hub. Victoria's 200 EdTech companies employed around 4,200 employees in 2021 and turn over an estimated $726 million in annual revenue. Melbourne was also crowned the EdTech Centre of Australia, according to the 2021 Holland IQ Australia and New Zealand EdTech 50 report. These elements underpin a thriving EdTech ecosystem, which is expanding to meet the needs of domestic and international markets. In response to the impact COVID had on the sector, we were looking for innovative ways to create new international competitiveness for the Victorian EdTech and online education sector. It's been really terrific partnering with EduGrowth. Um, they've been really fabulous at putting together this program and it's been a real standout for us. The program has connected Victorian and international education institutions to co-pilot an EdTech product, overseen by a researcher to produce an analysis, demonstrating the effectiveness of the EdTech product. This program is the result of years of advocacy from Edge of Growth to build the Australian EdTech ecosystem. For a very long time, EdTech entrepreneurs have told us that if they get real support from government, they can grow faster and into bigger markets. We know that test-based activation is a great way of de-risking the development of education technology businesses and education innovation as a whole. It helps attract investment, it helps going to new markets, and that brand halo that you get, that, that the reputation you get of government bringing you along is so, such an important program. There are well-defined models around the world for building innovation, and the Triple Helix model is one of them. In this instance, we connected edtech entrepreneurs, educators, academics, and with the support of government to actually deliver that innovation. We know that edtech entrepreneurs are impact-focused. So a program like this, which has been able to connect them to researchers to support the collection of rigour in an independent way has really helped them develop their businesses. The lead research did a great job in breaking down an incredibly complex concept and turning it into a framework that was usable. 
Having the support of the Victorian government in a program like this just reinforces the central role that Victoria plays across the entire Australian EdTech ecosystem. We thank Global Victoria for their support of the Victorian EdTech ecosystem and their ongoing partnership with EduGrowth. For us to use EdTech, we need to know if it works. But that's a, not such a simple thing. Who does it work for? In what circumstances does it work for? For what students? And what are some of the sort of potential unintended consequences? We've got to have a shared understanding of this. Part of the project was to build capacity around efficacy within EdTech providers. So we had a model that focused on particular aspects of efficacy that we worked with our research mentors on. And then they worked with the EdTech providers to really understand not just how can we do this for this project, but how can we do this in an ongoing sense. For a lot of our researchers, this was their first experience of working sort of hand in hand with EdTech companies. Uh, it was a challenging experience. I don't want to downplay how difficult this was at times to sort of come to understand a totally different way of working and a, you know, some different values and different roles that people have in the process. However, everyone's found it to be a wonderful learning experience, a wonderful way to build these connections with others and something that you know, they're going to think about as another way of working going forward, uh, trying to be this sort of critical friend and, and partner. The EdTech sector in Australia is really punching above its weight. We have some amazing companies that are really doing things that are becoming known internationally. So it's been really successful at getting Australian EdTech out there and in front of students and in front of educators. So we wanted to see, I guess, a positive impact on the outcomes that matter most to universities. So things like student experience, teacher experience are in there, but then also sort of academic outcomes as well. So um, student pass rates, academic integrity, all that sort of stuff. So we were looking for increases in social connectedness and employability from mentees participating in the Mentor Match program um, and also during an internship placement. We were looking to see the impact that student feedback would have um, in teacher practice. So teachers identifying changes that they could make based on the feedback, um, students being able to identify things that they were looking for in terms of support in the classroom, um, and if that would have an impact on engagement for students in the classroom as well. So Kahoot's model has been based on a, a collaborative or community-based pedagogy, and we really felt that what we were doing would actually fit incredibly well with the Latin market. Um, just from a cultural perspective, we're really excited to test that theory out and see if it was, if it was accurate. The project gave us an opportunity to create an evidence base that is crucial when we are talking to prospective customers. For you know, Cadmus in particular, working with the higher education sector, um, it's obvious how valuable research is to sort of the academics and the universities that we work with. So the ability to actually align with what they care about as well as a business has been incredibly valuable for us. When you're selling school improvement, to have research and evidence and, and credible research coming from leading institutions is critical. We thought we knew, going into this program, what research actually took. Uh, we discovered over, over the months actually how intensive it is and how much it requires the insight from, from experts, and that was incredible to have that. But now, through this process, we've developed our own skills and we've refined our skills and, and connections, and we're really looking to continue this process in an ongoing basis so that we can continue to enhance the efficacy of our platforms moving forward. Through the program, we've been able to really refine our existing pilot process, um, adding a bit more rigour to the evidence that we're collecting and sharing back to universities. We don't really have uh, much expertise in data, so the program enabled us uh, to look at data differently and also to develop a framework uh, that we were able to implement in the program so that we could uh, continue to test this 
not just for this program, but forever in the life of our product. Having an academic research partner that can guide the way you're thinking about the way you've designed your research, how you may design future research based on the outcomes that you've seen has been incredibly valuable. This program was terrific for strengthening our partnerships. Um, uh, it meant that we were far better engaged with Rotary, which is an international organisation, so not just here but overseas, but it also forced us to go into a market that we've been trying to go into for quite some time, being Vancouver. And uh, we were able to connect with a university that we've been wanting to deal with for a long time, uh, and also uh, with a Philippine-based uh, council uh, that we were able to connect with, and we've now got ongoing relationships with both those parties. The timeline of the project being sort of this short, sharp period that we were working to um, really allowed us to sort of expedite some of the conversations that we were having with existing universities, um, really leaning on the idea of, um, I guess, universities collaborating across research, across different regions as well. So we had the University of Melbourne and the University of Manchester, and we were able to align those two closely together. I think the program itself, I mean, what, you know, eight organisations, there was ourselves, Monash and the six schools, two of which were international schools. To, to have that group and that brains trust um, all working towards a common goal, I think, you know, provided opportunities that you don't always see with a simple client-supplier relationship. We were not in a position to leverage the relationship we had in China because of the lockdowns. What it did was it forced us to go elsewhere and actually engage with partners that were not on the original list of who we had targeted, but it gave us an opportunity to actually talk to them, um, articulate the benefits of the program, and actually run it as part of the project, which meant that the pilots were funded, they didn't have to pay for it, limited risk, and it basically enabled us to actually get people on board that we might have otherwise struggled to do. This initiative has broken down the traditional client-vendor relationship. Instead, we've partnered with leading institutions from Australia and America, and really what we've done is sit down as equals, as partners, and every week we've worked together with a common goal in mind. The interesting thing uh, for us with this project was that opportunity to explore new markets. Doing business overseas at the moment is incredibly expensive. And to have an opportunity, a funded opportunity, to try and build a partnership, a successful partnership in the UK, in New Zealand, um, that was an opportunity that small business doesn't always get an opportunity to do. So um, that, that was a huge win for us because whether we work with that school going forward, what we've learned from working with that school is massive. This program really has accelerated our push and our confidence to go into overseas markets. When we combine what we've learned through the sprint about the product and the platform and how it is aligned with that market and having a partner in the local market to actually be able to forge plans and, and deliver on, uh, that's actually set up the whole strategy now for what we can do in Latin America. So it's given us a great insight into that whole space. Through the EdTech Innovation Alliance, we've been able to gain our first credential aid client in North America. This is a key step in really opening up the entire North American market for EdElex. What we've learned in this project of six schools, we apply to hundreds of schools that we work with around the world. So the insights on how to measure efficacy, how to measure impact. I mean, what we've learned in this project, working with four schools in Victoria, we're applying to whole counties across South Carolina already. I would love to see every startup uh, undertake an initiative like this, because I think it's just so important. As entrepreneurs, we have hypothesis of what we, you know, of the, the solution that we have to solve problems, but it's only through initiatives like this that we actually get the concrete data to support um, what it is that we're trying to solve. A key component of this program was to test these Australian EdTech solutions on the global stage. And many of them were assessed by Education Alliance in Finland, which really looked at the pedagogical foundation of their product and how it impacted learners. Every solution that they 
assessed came out with very high scores, which just reinforces the quality of the edtech solutions being produced in Victoria and Australia. It's resulted in an enormous number of outcomes from a commercial perspective. We've seen new commercial partnerships developed, we've seen partnerships with new education providers, we've seen new markets opened up for companies, we've seen new employees added, we've seen some investment in some companies, we've seen them growing both locally and internationally. And that's before we even start to think about what that impact had on teaching and learning, which is really the, the guts of the program, the efficacy on the learners. It's clear that this program has been a watershed moment for educators and edtech entrepreneurs working in partnership together. And I think it's just the beginning. I think this is the beginning of a, of a much bigger movement. We're going to see this continue to grow. We now have a really defined model of connecting edtech entrepreneurs, academics, education providers to look at what is possible and what's probable from edtech development. I promise you weren't supposed to see seven minutes of my video and then me emceeing and <laughs> facilitating five sessions today. We've had some illnesses um, in both the EduGrowth team this morning and also some of our speakers. So uh, we, we roll the punches in 2022, don't we? we? We just move on and this is the way that the world works now. So um, thank you to everybody who provided their insights in producing that video. I think I need to go forward right now. Oh no, we're in the right spot. Sorry, see, I now I'm, I'm completely off my run sheet. I should stay on my run sheet and not try and make some decisions. Um, thank you for everybody who did participate. And the fun thing we get to do is we actually get to see all of those people here as well. So we can see if they've aged between filming that video and today. Um, I obviously have gone a little bit younger than that video, but uh, um, a few quick housekeeping things before we get started this morning. If you're looking for the restrooms, they're down the corridor just here to my uh, right, your left. Uh, we're going to have lunch at 12 o'clock, there'll be a break for, at 2.30 and then we'll have networking drinks at 4 o'clock if you're with us still at that point. Um, we encourage you to join the online audience. There is an audience online that are having a conversation on your name tag is a QR code which you're probably all incredibly trained and familiar with over the last couple of years. If you want to scan that on your mobile, you'll be able to jump into that online conversation as well because I, I, my, my understanding is there's 100 or 150 people online who are talking to us. And my run street says now I'd like to welcome David Linky because Luke was supposed to do that piece. So give me a moment while I just organise myself here. And what I what I've planned to do is to spend 10 or 15 minutes giving you a bit of an insight into how the program came about and unpacking components of it. And it is interactive, so if there's, a, if there's something that you'd like to ask or a question you, you have, by all means, please do jump in. And then we'll hear from Fiona, I think. Is it, that's what my run sheet says. Okay, awesome. Fantastic. All right. Um, oh, let me get a clicker going forward. All right. The Global EdTech, uh, sorry, the Global Victoria EdTech Innovation Alliance has been a watershed project for the Victorian EdTech ecosystem. Throughout this day, we're going to hear from all of the stakeholders in this important program. We'll hear from the EdTech entrepreneurs. We'll hear from the government stakeholders and actors who supported this program. We'll hear from these world-class researchers who contributed their intellect. And we'll also hear from the team that pulled together, pulled it all together from Edgegrowth. Well, actually, you may not. You might just hear from me because I think those other people are not here today. But, uh, um, and obviously the partners that conceived and then delivered the program. So over the next 10 or 15 minutes, I'll outline the program, the original ideas, and set up um, so we can hear the amazing outcomes throughout the rest of the day. And we're going up and down with blinds. I think when they were up completely, they were a bit squinty, so I think we want to probably stop somewhere. If it gets a bit squinty, but let us know, we can bring blinds down a little bit further as well. Um, a program like this is really only possible through um, real partnership. That's developed over a very long time, and, and it's a really interesting opportunity for the Victorian EdTech ecosystem around the way that we work with Global Victoria. EduGrowth had this concept and Global Victoria saw what was possible and probable from being able to support it. We worked together for quite some time to build the concept, to refine it, to alter it, and ultimately to activate it, which it feels, honestly, it feels like it's a couple of years ago, but I'm sure it was only some point in the middle of 2021 that we actually really got going. And a truly important component of the program 
that was added in at the last moment was the research aspect. And that was a, a, it was a fantastic component when we see the outcomes from it and seeing how it connected the universities, the researchers and the edtech entrepreneurs and education providers. And we'll talk in much more detail about the triple helix model of innovation soon as well. In 2018, EduGrowth ran a series of engagements across the country where we brought together 72 people from edtech government, education providers and um, government stakeholders, uh, researchers as well, to think about what do we need to do to build an Australian edtech ecosystem. And we published this report called Enabling the Growth of the Australian edtech Ecosystem, which had these six components. And number two there was TED Best, TED Best Activation. And um, all my Global Victoria friends in the room will know that I keep talking about Innovation Fund, Innovation Fund, Innovation Fund. I'll remind us that we have got an opportunity to do something incredibly big. There are um, many of these things we are, we are building out within the edge growth business model and the way that we engage. Our second re recommendation was testbed uh, model development. This program, the Global Victoria EdTech Innovation Alliance, was 100% within that um, strategy. It was about trying to connect EdTech companies, education providers to drive connection and collaboration. And we use this byline of edge growth is around connecting and collaborating to accelerate the Australian edtech ecosystem globally. And we know from research, Navitas Ventures, uh, back in about 2019 it may have been, did an analysis of the 40 leading edtech ecosystems around the world and they looked at the uh, city level, they didn't look at country level. And the thing that was crucial to the leading ecosystems was a way of connecting educators into the innovation pathway in collaboration with researchers and with edtech entrepreneurs. And this model fits 100% within, uh, within that remit. Let me detail a little bit more uh, about the actual concept and what we actually did, because it's a, still a little bit of an uh, a, a esoteric concept for you if you're just new to it. In essence, we were trying to create new international competitiveness for the Victorian edtech and online education sector. It was not one sector without the other. We expected to measure that via new commercial agreements, new exports markets being developed beyond trade missions, beyond the point in time. Back in the day, I used to talk about drive-by training in the corporate world, where you would come to a fantastic conference facility for a day, to someone would talk to you about you know, communication style, you'd go away with a nice binder of stuff and you'd go back to your work the next day and you bind it. If you were really um, impressive, you might take it home and read it again, but probably sat on that shelf on your desk. And it's one of those things about being able to, being able to build long-term sustainable programs that actually deliver those long-term outcomes where we were really interested in. We expected to see improved commercial outcomes for tech companies and online providers, and we've seen that. We wanted to build out a framework to connect education providers and tech companies that provided a model that others could replicate, they could access, and they could continue to use. And I think we've achieved that as well. And the final piece here was to try and connect researchers in, try and bring researchers into this conversation and I, I'm sure I'll get an opportunity to talk it, about it much more throughout the day. But one of the incredibly interesting byproducts for myself, I've been in ed tech for about 20 years, and I've had the pleasure of working with academics for a long time. And I guess I didn't realise the similarities between academic need and entrepreneurial need. They're actually really similar. There's a lot of overlap there. And I think that these are two entities that if we can push them together a little bit more um, regularly and on, on um, uh, with a framework, then we will get better outcomes. And, and the other thing that I want to mention here around this connection, if you spend a bit of time looking at the commercialisation activities of Australian universities, and I don't think this is unique to Australia, we have world-class research institutions in this country, including here in Victoria, who are leaders in their field. And one of the things that we tried to achieve was to bring earlier stage companies into that innovation cycle. Because it's really common to do industry research with the incredibly large multinational of Google and Microsoft and so forth. And it's much harder to get into those smaller entities. And that was one of our, 
uh, objectives as well. Longer term beyond this project, the scope is really big. We want to drive strong product development when connecting educators earlier in the cycle. There is lots of research around the world that looks at the amount of capital that is not deployed well when edtech companies build product that's excluding their potential customers. We, need, we wanted to reduce product development costs. We wanted to de-risk product development. We wanted to de-risk export market entry. And I think we've achieved many of those things. I'm sure there's still lots to be done. I don't want to paint the picture as that we've ticked the box. There are still many things that we need to achieve. I won't read these out, but I want, I want to highlight for you that there are a whole range of underlying assumptions. And the point that I want to make here is that this program required a leap of faith for all the participants the government, the edtech entrepreneurs, the researchers and the academic mentors need to t needed to take a step into a bit of the unknown because much of it was built as we were going. We had this concept, we had this framework and people brought their intellectual capacity to drive this forward. They needed to see a concept beyond the horizon, beyond next month's sales figures, beyond next month's reporting, beyond next month's activity. The educators need to, needed to think beyond what they were doing in their classrooms, in their lecture theatres and in their workshops. They needed to think beyond that. I will highlight three underlying assumptions that I think are incredibly important to understanding how the program was, de was um, designed. And this comes from a personal view here. The marketing in education needs to move beyond sales and focus on learner impact. Because if you, if you spend any time interviewing, if you have the opportunity to interview the successful edtech entrepreneurs and the ex successful education innovators, they actually don't think about the sale, they don't think about the money, they're thinking about what's it going to do for my end user and the learner. Um, our second assumption here was that efficacy it will become an even bigger part of the edtech story into the future. We talk about this concept all the time, but it will be crucial to commercial success of education technology businesses over the coming decades. Spend a moment thinking about or going and observing what's happening in some uh, North American markets, in some states where they're removing whole bunches of education technology components that are not showing efficacy and you'll see the need to bring it into the narrative of your product. And I think that the underlying assumption really heavily influenced by Emeritus Professor Beverly Oliver who was on the Edugrowth Board and also was the chair of the Program Governance Group really uh, was around this idea that edtech companies need to understand how to collect and use data with the most important being systematically with the language of their customers and we hoped to be able to refine that as we went along and we're going to hear from those lead researchers to see whether or not that actually happened but I preface and say I think we did. Um, checking my time. Okay. Some key program stats that the Treasurer this morning highlighted for us. There were nine EdTech companies from Victoria. Can I, can I just make a point here as well to our local audience and also our online audience as well, is that you didn't need to be a Victorian EdTech company. So I want to I want to highlight that you could have been an EdTech company in another state and participated. And I just want to I, I want to explain how important that is for the Victorian government to see that their role can be bigger beyond the state borders. It's incredibly um, important that uh, I highlight that because there are some times where people think, well, it's only a Victorian program. And in this instance, it wasn't. We had applications and expressions of interest from companies that were not in Victoria. None of them, unfortunately, got through the process, but that is just, just a, a byproduct. But I do want to highlight that important point. There were 27 education providers from 13 countries from across the globe covering the entire education system. Um, K-12 higher ed and uh, vocational training. I don't think we got any workforce. I know there was one workforce and I don't think we got any um, ELC. 165 educators, 4,110 learners, two research institutions and 11 actual researchers engaged in the program. So these are um, big numbers of people being able to participate. So let's try and think about what we actually did. Um, at the most basic level, the program was really simple. We connected a Victorian EdTech company to a local international education provider. They deployed their education solution for six months, and throughout that time, we asked researchers to measure the impact and define efficacy in partnership with them. It was much bigger than that, but we'll, we'll, we'll go with that. And in reality, it was incredibly complex. Over the last 12 months, we defined the efficacy in a workshop we conducted in a grant expression of interest and allocation process. 
And another key learning here is that EdTech companies need more support responding to grants. Every single person that was on the program governance group um, uh, will ma made that comment. And I'm still to actually speak to the entrepreneur, but there is one grant application that we will de-anonymise and we'll, uh, sorry, we'll anonymise and we'll de-identify, I should say is the right word, isn't it? De-identify it and we'll actually share that with some people who are interested because it's an exemplar of how to respond to a grant application and others should think about it and we, we will actually run a workshop to help people think about government grant writing because it's, a, it's an art, it's not a science and some of that art um, is understanding and reading uh, much broader than the grant document. Um, we appointed some world-class researchers, the team of professors Margaret Bierman, Michael Henderson, Philip Dawson did an amazing job distilling a complex idea into an accessible, usable and implementable framework. Let us not brush over how much thinking there is. We, we took a endeavour efficacy in education, which is incredibly complex. People spend their entire lives thinking about this, and these people spent a couple of uh, weeks coming up with a model and an accessible framework, and um, I commend you for the work that you did. Um, they implemented their EdTech solutions and they documented their success, and it all went smoothly and there were no problems, and it was exactly as defined, and everything we came up with at the start was delivered at the end, or maybe not. Um, the team that we built were gathered to bring expertise and experience across the entire program. An EdTech company needed to find a Victorian education provider and an international education, education provider. Edgegrowth appointed Deakin and Monash as the lead researchers who then went and found a series of research mentors. And finally, we seconded a group of people within Edgegrowth to support the program throughout and each of the teams with uh, constant work, Luke Seacom who's gone home today and Sophia Harland who's long, no longer with us who was our marketing lead for the project and did a great job communicating that to the market. We talked about what the objectives were and support for EdTech, um, mar uh, sorry, export market development is one of them. Every company entering a new market needs to start from zero. You need to start from zero in that new market. Regardless of how big you are in your home market, when you land on the shores of, I don't know, Brazil, Singapore, the UK, South Africa, you are essentially an unknown entity. So supporting those first steps with incredible brands accelerate the process enormously and adds to the credibility of that edtech company when finding their first customers in a new market. And the Global Victoria brand, Deakin University and Monash University, really fell into that brand halo component. If you've ever travelled across uh, Asia with an executive from Monash University, the, these people are rock stars. And so there is, an, uh, there is a role for our research institutions to play in helping edtech companies take those steps, but that might be a pitch for a later day. Um, we wanted to focus on engage, uh, ed educator engagement. EdTech companies needed to engage both a local and international education provider. They could not do it without them. We set up a structured pilot program which added credibility to the project and the organisation's commitment to that process. EduGrowth's program manager and their research mentor connected in regularly. I think Luke was speaking with each research team, sorry, each sprint team every month. There was a significant number of reports. Um, some of the evaluation may say there were probably too many reports, but we certainly knew what was going on in each of the projects all the way along. The education provider tested an innovative product via a funded pilot program. It completely de-risked it for the education provider and um, uh, their partners. And the most important piece here, I think, is, excuse me, is that research providers were part of the program communications all the way along. Um, they were part of the plan, they were in there with all other stakeholders. So this was not a project delivered to them, this was a project delivered with them. And I think it's a really important component when we're thinking about um, innovation in the education space. Sometimes these things are delivered out of a central office, whether it's an education department here in uh, Spring Street or a DVC education academic office in a university out in the suburbs. And in this model, we wanted the educators to bring their full understanding of thoughts to the process as well. Research was at the centre of this program, as I've mentioned a few times, but I'd like to acknowledge and thank the lead researchers, Professors Margaret Bierman, Michael Henderson and Philip Dawson. This project would not have been the same without your considerable intellectual contribution. 
Along with that, I'd like to extend my thanks to the research mentors to support each of the project teams. And I think um, Rebecca Audrey's in the room. I think you mentored about, I oh know she might actually not be in the room at this second. Um, she actually mentored a few of the teams, so she, she was really heavily involved. So the, these people did an amazing job, and it was uh, incredibly important here. And there is a really common model of innovation across society, which is the triple helix model, which includes government, university, and in this industry, in this in, in component industry, and we're talking about edtech companies. Our project added a fourth component, which was the educators. It's my personal belief that if we bring educators into this innovation pathway, we will get better outcomes for the learners, we'll get better outcomes for the edtech companies, we'll get better outcomes for the academics as well. So we ended up with this triple helix plus model where we started to add a few other components in. Um, we could not have uh, delivered true education and innovation without the educators. They are essential in driving what is needed for their students and their learners. If you ever spend time with a primary school teacher, they will say, my kids. And you have to ask, are you talking about your children at home or are you talking about the students in your classroom? You then start speaking to, and they'll do that publicly too. They'll do it in a forum like this, my kids. You then start speaking to uh, secondary school teachers and public, uh, privately they'll say my kids and then they'll start talking about their students uh, in a public setting. So there is an incredibly important bond there and the educators are essential to your deployment. If you're in edtech and you're, you don't understand that piece, then you're gonna have a really tough time um, producing commercial outcomes. We ended up with this accessible framework. We're going to hear from the actual researchers who find the framework, so I won't, uh, I'll leave all the details to them. But efficacy is one of those overused terms in education. We all use it all the time, but we don't necessarily know what it means. The lead researchers did an amazing job distilling a complex idea into an accessible, practical and usable framework. The tool allowed all edtech companies to consider their product their test educators and build an efficacy model that would yield the desired results. And it's, it's, it's not, um, I don't want to brush over this, the program would not have been successful if we had did not defined this, this framework and I think it's a framework we'll hear from edtech companies that they'll continue to, they'll continue to use. Um, we wanted to build edtech capacity and I, I won't read through this, um, you can read faster than I can. Um, the bits that are important to you. But the point that I put at the bottom there, uh, which hasn't quite come up the exact same way as on my screen, but there's a little bit of a gap there and a, a, a um, byproduct of this project has been, been building academic connections to industry with practical actions. There is this esoteric concept of let's connect industry and university and how do you bridge that gap? And um, you'll hear much more from me later this afternoon about how I think that we can do that. Oh, I think that's me done. Is that right? No. Oh, sorry. Um, that's right. I, I, I've mixed up two, two slide decks here. So our next steps, you're going to hear from me in the last session this evening or this afternoon about what I think the next steps might be. But let me give you a bit of a preference, prefer, a little bit of a preview if you're not able to hang around all day. EduGrowth has been convinced that connecting edtech entrepreneurs, education providers, researchers with a reputation of government will change the story for the sector. This project has confirmed that belief. We will reimagine the work that we do and the way we deliver and the way we engage with at the back of this project. So this afternoon I'll talk a lot more about what I think EduGrowth will be able to help and partner with and um, where we might be going. In the last 15 or 20 minutes, I've given you a very fast um, run through, a, a very big program. There are two, there, you can do an additional reading on our website, there's the address. There are two reports and at the moment there will be more up there over the next month that you can refer to, but designing an edtech efficacy research report is a, a, a detailed analysis of the framework that these guys built and then finally the Global Victorian EdTech Innovation Framework really defines the program and where it connected. So with all of that I think I'm done and uh, we're now inviting Fiona Litos who is the Director of International Education at Global Victoria where she leads the development and delivery of Victoria's international education strategy to ensure that Victoria is a destination of choice for international students and that Victorian EdTech sector supports students around the globe. Welcome, Fiona. 
I'll leave on my mess if that's all right. Thanks so much, David. Really appreciate that. Hello, everyone. Nice to see you all. Um, really, really pleased uh, to be here and thank you so much for the opportunity to say a few words. Um, uh, thank you, David, uh, for this terrific uh, event. Um, and before I do dive in, of course, I would also like to acknowledge the traditional custodians of the lands uh, on which we're all meeting today and uh, from where our many uh, online participants are also calling in from, we also acknowledge uh, those lands as well. Um, so I am going to keep my remarks very brief. I'm not going to repeat anything that the Treasurer eloquently has already told you about. Um, but I did just want to slightly build on some of those key messages uh, that the Treasurer went through. Um, so speaking from a global Victoria perspective, you know, we really see fantastic opportunities uh, for EdTech and we've, we've had that vision um, to grow a really robust and globally competitive EdTech sector in Victoria for many, many years. Um, obviously, many years pre-pandemic, um, you know, we were working very closely with our partners such as EduGrowth to really make sure that we were positioning Victoria as a world leader in education technology and innovation. Um, this has been a key priority, as I said, for many years. Um, the reason that we're doing this is because supporting a really robust and globally connected edtech ecosystem helps to ensure that Victoria uh, and its economy does remain globally competitive. The Treasurer talks a lot about the education state. Um, it's, it's a critical part of how we position ourselves nationally and internationally, uh, and edtech is, is integral to that. Um, Importantly, this also enables greater reach uh, and retention uh, for our global learners and very much enhances the student experience, which we all know is absolutely fundamental to that um, education proposition. So we think that now more than ever, EdTech is a really critical key part of the Victorian government's efforts uh, to help the broader international education sector to recover from the impacts of the pandemic. And of course, you've heard many people say this, but EduGrowth has been a critical partner for Victoria uh, on this path. Uh, and I'm sure that David would very much agree. Um, but be because of that collaboration over many years, collaboration in terms of policy, uh, collaboration on projects and programs, uh, that Victoria has been very well placed to capitalise on what we've seen as the real acceleration of education innovation, uh, which was propelled by the pandemic. So you all, you know, Victoria's EdTech companies who we're very, very proud of, uh, you responded incredibly quickly to that increased global interest and demand for online resources. Uh, you responded with really creative solutions to meet new market demands. And we've seen Victoria's EdTech exports actually grow pretty significantly over this time. So the Victorian government is keen to continue to be a partner uh, with you and to continue to assist ed tech companies and education providers to capture uh, not only really uh, impressive levels of investment, but also those export opportunities. Um, and we do that in a number of ways. Um, and just very briefly, there's a couple of uh, key aspects of this support that I'd just quickly like to highlight for you. So Global Victoria obviously leads uh, on Victoria's EdTech uh, um, priorities and we're really keen to make sure that we continue to position Victoria as a leading EdTech hub uh, to grow both trade and investment attraction. We're very keen to continue our capacity building and collaboration um, between ed tech companies and education providers, which um, David so eloquently uh, talked about as a really critical uh, key priority and key lever. And we do have a commitment to innovation in the delivery of international education, um, both in Victoria and also offshore. Uh, so we're very committed to not just go back to the way things were pre-pandemic, but con to continue to innovate uh, and look at um, what those changing consumer preferences are and be very responsive to those changing uh, consumer preferences. So the EdTech Innovation Alliance, that's one really great example of how we put these objectives into action uh, and, and a really good example of the approach that we're trying to take. 
Um, so I won't go into too much detail because David's given a, a really brilliant overview of the program. Um, but just from our perspective in Global Victoria, I think it's important just to note that uh, the program I think has been incredibly valuable because it has brought ed tech companies, education providers, uh, researchers together to develop a really impressive model for efficacy research, which we can take into the future. Um, and this is a point that's made, been made um, quite a bit this morning, but I think it's it's worth repeating. I think that's a really valuable uh, and really innovative model that we uh, want to continue to support. And it's also really impressive, I think, that in Victoria, we're the first state or territory to actually uh, deliver a program such as this. So we're really well placed, I think. Just to give you a couple of examples of other ways that we support the ed tech sector in Victoria. So Global Victoria has been a principal sponsor and partner of the annual Edutech International Con Congress and Expo. So we attracted this uh, key conference to Melbourne down from Sydney. Um, it's going to be in Sydney, in, in Melbourne again in 2023, which is really fantastic. Um, and we used uh, that opportunity to really align with um, the existing uh, Melbourne EdTech Summit, which also happens uh, in August. So what we've done is really uh, leverage those two really impressive events uh, to create a whole week of edutech thought insight uh, and engagement with uh, educators and industry. Um, so that's a, a really significant initiative. It's an entire week dedicated to edtech, which happens every year, which we're really proud of. Um, and we had record numbers this year, by the way. It was a really outstanding, uh, fantastic initiative. We also support edtech companies through virtual and physical trade missions. Um, so it's so nice to be able to actually run physical trade missions again um, and to see our physical trade mission program uh, recommence. Um, so we've had missions to the US, to Latin America, to India, to the UAE, uh, and all throughout Southeast Asia um, to support edtech companies export to key markets. Um, so please do keep an eye out for opportunities for uh, uh, your participation in trade missions. I also just wanted to remind you all that uh, you can always access our uh, support, uh, connections and advice through our network of 23 Victorian Government Trade and Investment Offices worldwide. Um, we have an extensive global education network. We've got Barish here today with us, who is our education specialist in the UAE. Um, so we have uh, a really fantastic network of education specialists throughout our key markets. Um, and they're, they're really fantastic at, uh, you know, actively helping Victorian companies with, you know, whatever uh, needs might be. It could be introductions, it could be sharing information about commercial opportunities, it could be helping to identify potential partners. Um, you know, our people are there to really help you in terms of what you're looking for. And also we have our Study Melbourne Hubs, uh, which we really want edtech companies uh, to use as a fantastic facility that you can um, use to engage with potential clients, potential partners. Uh, you can use the facilities to showcase your technology. Um, there's a variety of ways that you can engage with our study hubs. Um, so please do know that that standing offer, um, it's, it's uh, you know support that's free of charge and it's always there and available to you. So just very briefly, um, in conclusion, I, I wanted to let you know, if you're not already aware, um, that the Treasurer recently launched Victoria's new International Education Recovery Plan. Uh, so this is a recovery plan which is backed by $52.9 million worth of funding. Uh, it takes us up to the year 2025 um, and it articulates a number of commitments, actions and programs that the Victorian Government is going to continue to roll out and some new initiatives as well that will roll out um, in, in terms of the, the medium term and how we see international education uh, recovering up until 2025. Really importantly, this plan positions edtech and education innovation as a key pillar uh, and we um, have a couple of key goals, which is really about Victoria being a leader in student experience and graduate outcomes, strengthening linkages with our very well established market, but also looking at new markets, so high growth markets and diversity markets, um, and positioning Victoria for uh, having a global reputation for education excellence. And as I said, education, innovation and digital technology is a critical uh, enabler across all of those key priorities. Uh, and please do have a look at it because there's some really fantastic um, edtech specific initiatives in that plan as well. 
So it just leaves me to say that uh, Global Victoria were very committed to continuing to support the edtech ecosystem in Victoria. Um, I just wanted to congratulate all of the project participants researchers and all of our partners across the nine projects um, under this program. A big thank you to David and the team at EduGrowth for steering this program so brilliantly. Um, we think the outcomes achieved to date uh, are incredibly impressive and we're just really keen to make sure that this program continues to create a legacy for you all and love to see that continued success. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, Fiona. And, and if you don't know, the expression of interest for your Singapore EdTech trade mission are open right now, yeah? Yeah, so there is a trade mission to uh, Singapore and it feels like about five weeks. So in about five weeks time, and I think expression of interest is still open right now. So now, if I just jump through and make sure that I'm on the right page here, remarks, yes, yes, we've done that. Okay, Luke's supposed to be back, he's not back here. Um, all right, so a core part of the EdTech Innovation Alliance program was research into the efficacy of the EdTech solutions being deployed. The research team from Deakin University and Monash University added amazing ideas and thoughts and intellect to the program. The three lead researchers are here to give us an insight into how they designed the research component and some of the key learnings. And I think Phil Dawson is going to be our facilitator. So I get to introduce Phil, which is, Phil is Professor, uh, sorry, Professor Philip Dawson is Associate Director of the Centre for Research and Assessment in Digital Learning at Deakin University, Cradle. All right. um, he researches assessment in higher education with a particular focus on feedback and cheating. Phil has degrees in um, education, artificial intelligence and cyber security. Wow. All right, Phil, over to you. Uh, thank you. Thank you all so much. Um, it's a joy to get such an introduction after everyone's seen inside your bedroom and seen your guitars. So, um, <laughs> no, the, the big hairy guy with the guitars in the bedroom. I, I get the joy of introducing my dear friends who have been my mentors for about a decade. You may or may not have clicked that in. No, no. So I. Professor Michael Henderson, Monash University, real leader in, yeah, rah, rah, Michael. <laughs> I, lo I love your, your run up. Yeah, real leader in ed tech. Um, I think it's some, I, I have this memory of you being on the Australians thing as like the number one education researcher in the country at some stage. You were, you're one of those things. You're, yeah, according to, according to someone. And my dear, very close colleague, Professor Margaret Beerman from Deakin University, my colleague in Cradle, who I'd say taught me most of what I know about how to research in education. So if you know, if you don't like something, it's it's all it's all, it's all on Margaret. Um, yeah, look, this has been an absolute joy to be a part of. Um, the success of this program really can't be highlighted enough. Different people have highlighted different things throughout. I'll, I'll pick just a, just a few. Uh, you know, people who participated as mentees with Mentor Match, some of them went and got jobs they wouldn't have got otherwise. The impact for those individuals is huge, things that just wouldn't have happened otherwise. People, you know, students who took part in Maths Pathway, a bunch of them ended up going on to say, you know, they, they feel confident, feel ready to take that higher level of Maths take maths to the next level. That's, that's a really big deal, that sort of feeling of, of preparation, in addition to, you know, the improved scores or whatever. And, you know, I'm obsessed with cheating and academic integrity, and I'll note that, you know, Cadmus's experiences in, say, Manchester, really dramatically reducing instances of academic misconduct breaches. These are really huge outcomes out there for, you know, not, not the companies, but for the, the individual learners involved. And I've got to say, when people come to me and they're interested in pitching some sort of educational product, that's the stuff that I'm after. I'm after that, that evidence of efficacy, of, of something being different, of some improvement for real people. So that's sort of my blah, blah. That, I mean, I'm also here for the, the nuts and bolts of what we did. We had a bunch of these nine sprints who went through that competitive process to get to be a part of this. We got to work with some amazing other researchers. We are about three of the 11 people that were in that little circle. And they, they were amazing researchers in their own rights who gained so much from working in partnership 
with these different teams and with their educators. We worked with them. We built kind of a structure around which they'd be able to have conversations about efficacy with their uh, various people, with their partners, with educators, and we provided, I guess, a little bit of accountability, you know, having to produce something as a result. We are really focused on efficacy, and efficacy is such a, a slippery term that I will let Michael Henderson have the, the joy of being responsible to explain. So that's how the, the morning's going to go, is that we'll just pass it backwards and forwards whenever uh, we get to the hard questions. Absolutely. Okay, right. So efficacy, it, it is, it is, it's such a simple word, but it, and you think it might mean a simple thing. I mean, if you look up the dictionary, it simply says, have you achieved the thing that you hoped for? Problem is, we all have different hopes. You know, is it for simple profit? Is it simple for market share? Is it um, for the, the uh, educational improvement or efficiencies in administration and educational uh, leadership? Yeah, all of these things can be uh, different and how do we measure those things? But if we just focus on the pure notion of efficacy, I think we'd be missing a big part of the story of um, efficacious products out there internationally. And so as a team, we decided to go a little bit broader and we thought, well, instead of just looking at the intended outcome, and that can mean a lot of different things, we thought what we really need to be understanding is things that a simple efficacy model couldn't do, and that's talk about how and why something is really successful. So we started looking further and we, uh, two very common uh, evaluation models are out there um, around process and outcome evaluation. And they can tell you how, and they can even tell you to what extent. But bringing them together also helps you understand why. And so bringing these models together, we started to think about, well, what does it mean then for efficacy, research, and partnership? And we realised underlying all of these models is reliable data and meaningful interpretation. One of the things, of course, is you know we, we're all and like every every ed tech business is successful in doing what it does. You wouldn't be here if you weren't. But sometimes we need to have deeper insights. We can collect data, say, around student satisfaction or uh, you know, client satisfaction. But what does that tell us? Does that sat high satisfaction? Does that mean we're actually achieving the kind of learning outcome changes that we get up in the morning for? I suspect we don't all get up in the morning for just a dollar. We get, we're, we're getting up to make a difference. So how do we reliably understand that? How do we also know that we haven't done something that's negative or you know, harmful in some way that we weren't expecting? And so we have to keep our eyes wide open for all of these possibilities. So engaging in that, we started to come up with an idea of going, well, how do we engage both researchers and edtech companies in meaningful conversations and direct the attention to uh, sort of this kind of deeper insight. And we realised there wasn't anything out there that we could easily apply. And so we started coming up with our own model of the PF model that we've come up with. And Margaret was a uh, sort of a central figure in coming up with some of this uh, new thinking. Margaret. I really see how this is going to work. Um, I, didn't, I did not come up with a PF acronym, but I will have you all note that it could be EPF as well too, which is, um, you know, easy to remember. Um, so, um, PF. For those who were involved in the sprints, you probably were, became a little bit overly familiar with this model. There are, the, the, the idea here is we wanted to take some of the key elements of um, things that fed into making a product work inside you and capture them simply. PF stands for process, intended outcome, acceptability and feasibility. And some of these things are clear and some of them are, are a little bit more tricky when you can't boil, boil down to actually collecting the data. So process is how you go about stuff. Process is important, process matters. You do need to consult with stakeholders, you do need to do um, your homework in a whole uh, range of ways. It might even be useful, this is an academic speaking, to read the research literature and see what has been said about your product or models before. That all feeds into process. Right processes matter. 
Intended outcomes are st seemingly straightforward, but what we mean by intended outcomes are the things that the, the difference that the product makes on the ground. And it's also worth, when you look for these things, as Michael mentioned, looking for things that are unintended. Technology is never neutral. We, we act as if it is, but it actually has all sorts of effects that are not what we intend. And sometimes those effects can be incredibly beneficial. And if you close yourself off to them, you might actually end up with wonderful insights from your product that you haven't thought about. Also, you can expose harms. I mean, who would have thought, and for those of you who are old like me, when the internet came about, that um, this this world that we live in would have happened. We wouldn't have predicted it. We have to be open to the possibilities. So that's intended outcomes. Now we wanted to separate that from acceptability. Acceptability is how much people like stuff. Liking stuff is not the same as intended outcomes. It's often used as a proxy measure, particularly in education. Getting a sense of education making a difference can be very difficult for learners because how do you measure learning? If we knew that, education wouldn't be quite as complicated as it is. It's a really complex, difficult thing. Learning can happen now, it can happen tomorrow, it can happen in five years' time. It can be a small thing, it can be a large thing. So measurement is really hard. Acceptability is often what we use as a proxy. How much do people like it? Sometimes people can really like things, really like things that don't have the intended outcome. And I've seen plenty of ed tech products that are in that situation. But liking stuff is important. If people don't like stuff, they're not going to use it. It will never lead to the intended outcomes. And finally, feasibility. Feasibility, absolutely straightforward. Is it logistically possible from a company perspective? Is, is the cost point right? Is the is you know, cost benefit analysis going to work? A lot of the time people don't think about feasibility in these very early stages. Will it be scalable comes into this model as well too. So those, the, this facet of the model. So that's PF and you can see it's very broad ranging and it's a little bit different from your standard research efficacy because we draw a lot from evaluation models here. Very simple, hopefully useful. And what we saw play out in our, um, in the sprints is that for some people this model really resonated with them and it really made a lot of sense and they will continue to use it. For others, perhaps less so, but it also perhaps provoked some thinking about how they were already thinking about efficacy to turn them in slightly different ways. I'll just add to that as well and say that the, the PF model was both outward and inward looking. So we often think about efficacy in terms of did we have the impact on the institution? Did we, uh, you know, what kinds of um, indicators do we have of its feasibility with that institution or, or something on those lines? Um, but really we're also saying look, look at your own business as well. Um, one of the issues, for instance, if we think about process, is I think we're all pretty comfortable with the idea that we do something, then we go and ask someone, did it work for you? Okay, that's normal. But it's interesting when you try and track that information, sometimes that information that you get from the end user doesn't necessarily get back to the various teams or, or other people involved within the company or partners of the company that they can act upon it. Um, if we look at any of these kinds of elements, if we think about feasibility, for instance, feasibility is not only is it feasible, you know, are you able to make a profit, the necessary profit that you need to grow your business from, and that's feasibility internally. Externally, it's also what are all of the costs, the hidden costs, the labour costs, the identity costs, you know, the brand costs to the end users, to the partners that you're working with, and how do we understand that? So it's both outward and inward. Yeah, I, th I think we have this idea in there as well that it's it's sort of multiplicative, so it's not P plus I plus A plus F. For some reason, it's it's times. It's P times A, I times A times F. I don't know why that's hard to say, but this this really builds on this sort of thinking that a real strength in any of them can multiply and, and be wonderful, but a real deficiency can really cut it all away because if it's not feasible, 
It's just not going to work. It's, it can't be efficacious. So feasibility is zero. The whole thing is zero. And I think it also really helps us get away from what is sometimes kind of simplistic thinking around efficacy. Um, there's, there's been great debates in education around a thing called effect sizes and, you know, we can reduce any educational intervention down to one single number that will tell us whether it's worthwhile doing or not. But that number will only tell us like a fraction of what we put inside intended outcomes. It won't tell us any of the other stuff that's in there. So I guess the other big piece of this was partnerships. You know, we, we did this in partnership with people. It wasn't some sort of us, the, the researchers from on high, going in and conducting an evaluation. Um, I wondered if, if either of you had thoughts on your experiences of, of partnership there. Um, <laughs> so so I, I think it's useful for us to, to go back one step a little bit. Like We realised that we had a model that uh, was a little bit different from everywhere else and the idea was to focus everyone's conversations but not limit them because how everyone approached the PF model was different across all the sprints. But the other part with that was, well, how do you implement it? And uh, with wonderful conversations with, with David in EduGrowth, um, you know, we, we really started to uh, play with the notion of partnerships. One of the things as an academic across my career is I often get ed tech companies coming to me, you know, doing cold calls and things like that, and they're saying, we've got a great product. Uh, you can have it for free if you want to evaluate it. I'm going, OK. Um, do you know who I am and what do I do? Or the other one is they'll come to me and they'll say, hey, we've got a great product, we're doing great work, uh, how much will it cost for you to come and tell us that it's a great product? Um, and I go, okay. And the problem is I'm not cheap and it becomes a pretty expensive endeavour to keep buying me in to come and do this work for you as a transaction. And we realised that we didn't want to set up that kind of model because I, I don't feel good at the end of the day, charging lots of money, giving you a, a report, and I don't feel like I've really achieved what I want, which is change in the world, um, and you get this one thing you know, at the end of it. And we, we all together realised that this isn't what we got up in the morning for. What we really like is a partnership, and we really think it's valuable to sort of think about this as a process in which we can help partner, facilitate, coach, support, be a guide on the side, a critical friend, whatever you want to call it, to build ed tech companies' capabilities around the critical you know, use and application and seeking and interpretation of data. And that was one of the core principles that, that we sort of found. The other one was the idea of being participatory. As an outsider coming and just doing an evaluation, I have a certain perspective and really good research is getting right into the thinking of both the provider and the end users and really coming to understand what this means. You know, a, a single dimensional, you know, kind of evaluation is simply one figure or one product, one effect size, um, doesn't really tell you a lot, doesn't tell you how you got there or why you got there or, or to be honest, more importantly, what to do next. And so again, we came back to the idea, a partnership model was the most useful. Margaret? So I, I, I'm not sure if you're, you're interested or how our time is going, but I thought I might share with you a little bit about what that partnership model was, because this is actually, to me, one of the critical pieces. As David said, you know, we were, we were all working out how this was going to unfold as it was unfolding. It hadn't been done before. And it really came to us when we were looking at the work that the most important thing here was about giving ed tech companies, as Mark was saying, the capability. The capability to keep on doing this work and the one way that that wouldn't happen was this, is if we hired people to come in and do the evaluation. So we want, and we also knew that educators, whether they be in higher ed in schools, already had a decent enough idea about what they thought research was and what educational research was. And some of some partners, in fact, to, to a very high level of expertise. So the key underpinning idea here was that we assigned research mentors. These were people who would work with the sprints to help them 
identify, collect, work with data and interpret the data in a way that was meaningful for them. And so each sprint had a research mentor and we tried to, our role was to try and coordinate all of that together. We did that with several through several means of connecting with the mentors, but the whole the whole thing was driven, we saw, critically by relationships, and we selected research mentors as much for their ability to work with people as their expertise. We saw this as being critically important. I think that's probably all I need to say on that. I mean, there's more nuts and bolts in general, but I think that's, that's the, the fundamental idea. Thank you both so much. So, I mean, we can talk about this stuff for literally forever, but I was wondering if anyone either in the room here or online, we have access to the, the Slido, has any questions for us? Yeah, thank you, thank you. Yeah, so the, the question is the research, was it based on the complete product or on a sort of developing, evolving product? And I'd, I'd say that really varied across the sprints. Some of them were coming to us with a really, you know, well-developed set product that they'd done successfully in Australia and now they're, they're trialling in another country, whereas some were in, in pretty early stages. We asked them to collect data over three time points the baseline, at the midpoint of the sprint, at the end of the sprint. And so for some people that, that you know, the product didn't change between those points, for some people it did. I mean, I'm interested to understand about in the framework that you built, did we consider control groups? Did we consider testing data with others? And, and I, the lead on question is, how do you actually do it? In, in an education setting, how do you actually set up a control group, if it's even possible, I guess, is the, is the broad question. You see we're all jumping for this one. Yeah. Well, That's what I, I, think, I think that um, I, I alluded to earlier that we drew from evaluation frames here rather than research frames. Now, evaluation research is a very particular thing. So if you are trialling a vaccine, you need a control group. I, I would imagine, and as a consequence, we're all very happy, or most of us are very happy as it turns out, not everyone, to um, have an injection. So that's what we do when we have a vaccine. It's very measurable. Education is a much more complex, complex beast. Now sometimes, in some circumstances, I work in healthcare a bit, you can take an education process and test it in that very similar way by keeping your control. You can control things very, very tightly. But for the most part in education, it's very difficult to run a control group. People are different. There was a huge, in the 60s, they decided they were gonna do all this right in America. And they, were, they invested, I think, the equivalent to today's billions of dollars in running a trial in um, schools across the US. And they did it for several years. And the final report went something like, well, the intra-school variables, the, the variation within the schools far outweighed the differences between the schools that were trialling the different systems. In other words, there, people are so variable that capturing that sort of data that you need to control it is really, really, really difficult. So we go for other means. We still, and again, I work in health. In health, a lot of the time, people need to make decisions because they need to make decisions. If you, if you go into an intensive care unit, you're not going to be getting treatment that's based on randomised controlled trials. You're going to be treat, getting treatment that's based on judgement and evidence. And that's the sort of model that we went looking for here. Uh, it, it's one of it's probably one of the most contentious things we've got in education that that matter of sort of the, the controlled trial um, along with some colleagues I published recently a paper looking at the flipped classroom and we analyzed essentially every single trial type study that we could find about it and yeah we can say the flipped classroom is probably better than not the flipped classroom 
but inside each and every one of those little studies, I'm concerned there's all sorts of weird and wonderful things going on that mean maybe it wasn't the same type of flipped classroom or maybe this class was weird and all, all sorts of stuff. That's really hard and it's just so costly as well. We couldn't have done it in this sort of context. It doesn't work for a quick sort of project like this. This kind of work um, uh, in, in any ed tech kind of space, you know, where, where we, we sort of sit within the space of intervention kind of things, right? Like we, we take a product or a service and we put it into a place and now we're looking to see has it made a difference. Um, the interesting thing is, of course, unless we're being really critical about what data we're collecting, we're going to find the stuff that we go looking for. It's the, it's, it's the reason why we're in this game, because we've been slapped over the wrist so many times about saying don't treat what you're seeing as necessarily the truth. Be critical about it. Try to dig down deeper. Um, it's quite, quite compelling to take a product in and all of a sudden you see in this class or this school there's increased uh, learning outcomes or increased teacher satisfaction or 20% efficiencies in, in whatever. But we also know in social science research that behaviour changes the second someone sees a new product or thing happening, a new process. Um, when a administrator pays $100,000 for something to be implemented, that administrator is going to be knocking on the doors and walking up and down the corridors just that little bit more frequently. So all of these little kinds of changes can start to impact. And of course, uh, our products and services are, are always at the whim of timetables and public holidays and, and uh, illnesses and um, curriculum changes and things like this. So control trials, uh, intervention studies, they're all at risk. It's not to say we shouldn't try to do them. And there are ways to do them. Um, but often they deal with um, issues of scale, so you need to do it quite large. You need to have quite a degree of rigour. And from my perspective, you need to have a lot of um, humility in being able to say, I haven't proven it, but I have gathered evidence and I have gone at this interpretation in such a way that I feel here is a compelling story. And that's different from saying, I've proven it. And I think that gives you a kind of honesty and integrity. Um, and certainly, being an old school teacher, um, I, I find that someone coming to me saying, this is the evidence I got, this is, what, this is the people who have been part of that evidence gathering at you know, these other schools, these other places, um, and this is what we're sort of seeing. But if you come to me and you're trying to do the glossy sell of saying, we've proven it, I'm going, ah. Oh and I'm starting to get a little bit worried. So I think there is, there is some value in not necessarily having to feel like you have to go for that 100% um, bulletproof kind of story. And I think one of the things that was really, really exciting for me to see in the, in the, um, in the sprints was that people were coming back to us and looking at the data they had and, and assessing it with a degree of integrity, recognising its limitations, recognising what could be said from it, and also recognising when perhaps the scale was too small or when further work needed to be done. Um, it, you really felt that, 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 this, that the, the companies are really starting to embrace what the data was actually meaning, as well as meaning for themselves and their products, as well as a marketing tool, and that to me was really exciting. Thank you so much. We've got time for one brief highlight from each of us and then we will hand over our time. Any, anything, yeah, any, any, but only one. Actually, as, as a, um, someone who's been around the block a few times and been involved in a lot of different projects or with a lot of different ed tech companies, this one's been really uh, insightful in seeing and uh, working with a number of CEOs, uh, working with Edge Growth and getting to understand Global VIX um, sort of agenda and how things work. Um, and then also the other, other joy for me, more, more than an insight, has been working with sort of more junior researchers, but then mentoring them into going, okay, you have a research agenda, but here is an opportunity to not engage, necessarily engage with that, but try to understand the edtech company's needs and learn how this ecosystem within which we research often, how, how the broader ecosystem works and what all of their needs are. Yeah. I think for me, one of the nicest things about working on this has been the fact that it has been generative. 
we really came from just some ideas, and I talked before about unintended outcomes. And I think in some ways, a lot of the outcomes in this, yes, we probably hit where we were going, but so much more happened. And therefore it was exciting, it was interesting, it was um, about people putting their minds together to build something bigger than the idea was that, ca that, that started in the first place. Thank you, and I'm gonna say working with EduGrowth, um, just thank you so much for all, all that you've done to build this structure, to connect people. Um, and I, I guess that the learning for me is that we all are in this for, for learning. That seems to be the thing we all, we all care about. So thank you. Thank you so much, everyone, for your time. Join me in uh, thanking Philip, Margaret and uh, Michael for their contribution um, to the program as a whole and also for speaking with us this morning. Um, I've gone and got a lapel mic so that I don't have to hold um, my uh, a microphone in front of me. Uh, just a reminder that if you want to join us online for a conversation, you can do so. You can jump in jo uh, Slido and have a, a chat. There is a conversation happening over there. We're going to stay with the research theme for a little longer and we're going to actually hear from other research mentors who actually, uh, actually mentored a few groups. So, Rebecca, why don't you come and join me? and I'll get rid of all of this other stuff and we can jump into a conversation. But allow me to sort of formally introduce you. So Rebecca Audrey is a researcher working in the field of academic integrity. She's led international project teams on the topic and has collaborated with researchers globally and has uh, previously project managed and developed a large bespoke university learning analytic tool. Maybe we'll jump into that at some point as well because that's a huge area of interest. So why don't, we, why don't we begin by getting a little bit of scene setting here and thinking a little bit about the role of the research mentors played in the project because I think it was one of the really nice pieces that came as a bit of a byline. Thanks, David. Oh. No, I can't hear you. There, there you go, now you're sure. Hello. Sorry. Yeah, now we can hear you. Um, thank you so much for the opportunity to talk about this because I think for me one of the interesting things as a research mentor was actually understanding all of the different companies and that was touched on in all the sessions this morning that people came with their own agendas but we were all working towards one of the primary objectives to understand efficacy of ed tech within the edgy growth and, and the global Victoria climate of growth, but also for themselves, for their clients, for their products, and ultimately for the participants or the students who were using these tools. So for me as a mentor, it was trying to ascertain the primary objectives that each team had, and I should say each because I actually mentored three of the companies. So for me, it was interesting as well to be able to cross compare them and use good examples and sometimes bad examples of things that didn't quite go right to get people to work in a way that would lead them to the completion of their sprint with the least panic, um, maybe the least stress. Um, and I can see one of my teams here. <laughs> so it was a really interesting role to bring research into that idea. Now, my background has been professional work, but also research, so I can understand the potential panic that companies would have when they're told they need to do research. And I know that some of my first conversations were, you know, de-escalating that panic and getting people on board with understanding that this, this research wasn't going to be something that was going to overtake the whole project, but it was going to be within their project. That's a really important point that I think we should just pause in a moment. And you'll hear academic and researchers talk about capital R research, and then you'll start hearing about concepts like action research, and you'll hear all sorts of other um, comments there. Question without notice, well, where do you think this project fitted into that model, right? Like, you know, we, I asked the leading question about control groups, and now I'm going to ask you a leading question about where, where does it fit in that, in that spectrum. Well, I think um, it was not a capital R research no. because it was a sprint. And for anyone that does research, we all know you can't sprint your way through research as much as we might want to. But it was getting the ideas and the tools of research to be used in a way that could be sprinted through. So going back to the role of the research mentor for a moment, I'm really interested in 
I, I assume it was Mark, Phil, or, or Michael said, "Hey, you, you want to come and mentor some re, uh, some commercial people?" Yep. And you had a model in your mind. <laughs> then you lived in it for six months, and you had a model at the end. What 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 did you think was going to happen at the start, and what ended up happening at the end? And did it change? I, I think it changed very rapidly at the beginning, in the first couple of weeks. But after that, it for me, it remained the same, definitely. And the beginning was. Uh, I think just a misunderstanding of my role that I would not be doing the research for people, that I would be mentoring people in how to do that. And part of that was to empower these companies in order to understand that they do have the tools and the data or access to data to enable them to continue to do research ongoing. So it was mentoring people through that. And I think after those first couple of weeks of understanding the definition of the role, it was, for me, I thought, my teams can disagree, but I thought it was smooth. I would agree with that. I think that's an observation across the whole program about what is the role that the researcher and the research mentor is going to um, play in, the, in each of the sprints. And I actually generally think it was an iterative process of coming up with this term of research mentor. I think we sort of agreed that a few weeks in because we were like, wait a sec, we need to try and label this so that people get an understanding of what the role of that research mentor is, which sort of leads to this idea of what, what did you actually practically do in real terms? What did we actually do with some of the people who are nodding in this room? What actually happened? What did the researchers do? I think one of the first things I wanted to do was understand the objectives of each individual team because it's a lot more... Did, did they know? Well, so... Okay. I, I think <laughs> yes and no. Okay, good. Um, now, the, the PF model, you know, is an acronym that I had not thought of until today, and I don't know if I'll think of it again. But those, <laughs> those four words that brought up the being able to measure and define efficacy was not necessarily in the objectives. So people had aims and they had sub-objectives, and obviously everyone, you know, wanted their product to succeed, they wanted it to grow, and they wanted to do X, Y, Z. Now, what was important about my role was getting people to understand those four sub-elements, um, and I won't, you know, we've just heard all about that, and it, it was understanding, though, what they already had that could answer that, or in fact, what they didn't have. And that mapping process at the beginning was the most important because some of those objectives were so broad they wouldn't have been able to effectively answer them at the end. I think this is a really important point. There is a difference between defining what you think your product is delivering and secondly being able to gather data that shows that it is doing those things. And I think that that's one of the things that I heard throughout this program from the innovation sprint team and some of the research mentors and I won't name anyone because people tend to talk to me under Chatham House rule, but I had a conversation with one of the research mentors who was working with one of the teams where that research mentor's comment in broad terms was, I've spent a lot of my time trying to bring them back from 753,000 data points back to three that will actually be able to show a real impact, not just collect it for the sake of collecting it. Which brings me back to a conversation I had with Beverly Oliver over the last couple of years, which is around her observation that edtech companies as a whole lack an understanding of rigorous and systematic use of the data. Not necessarily, they all say they've got data, but whether or not it's usable data and shows their thing. So can we, can we jump forward a little bit? and taking, launching off that idea of sort of helping refine things. Did you see a, a role beyond just the research, but actually starting to talk about product and what it looked like and what it might be doing and what it may not be doing and language development? Definitely, and, and that happened in all of my three teams. And it was after they started to understand what data they had and how they could use it. Um, and again, it was mapping out objectives. So I tried to get the teams to think about what data do you have that can answer this objective, but then go backwards as well. You've, you've got this objective you want to answer, but what do you actually have that will, actually res that will respond to that? And so often people went away um, 
and then they would come back to the next meeting and say, we've just realized we've actually got all of these things in the back end of our system that we haven't been using in that way. So often it was, um, and, and you know, this is almost a crude use of data to be able to respond to very simple, almost binary questions or net promoter scores or satisfaction surveys. But often those surveys and those data points can answer a lot more questions if you've mapped your objectives out clearly. Yeah, um, which just raises a question in my mind around qualitative versus quantitative data and whether or not that, what, what the value of both is? I think for one of my teams in particular, it was hugely valuable because they... They had both or to which either one? They, they had both, okay. but they were promised the world from one of their partners and it didn't deliver. And so there was this panic moment in the last couple of weeks where they were saying, we don't, we don't have this data we, that we were told that our partner was gonna give us all of this quant data, we haven't got it. They haven't done it. We can't keep asking them, what are we going to do? And, I, and so we talked through what they had. And they'd actually done very, very in-depth interviews with their partners, with their partners' contacts and other key stakeholders. So I, I reviewed the, the interview questions. And within that, we mapped that across to the objectives. And that qualitative data on its own was actually able to respond to most of their objectives with whatever quantitative data they had that could back that up. So you don't always just need a load of numbers and figures in the back end of your system sat in a data warehouse. You can actually get these responses from really in-depth conversations, I think. Not on its own, though, I would say. I think that's an important... You made it before. You made the comment before around de-escalating expectation or um, um, nerves around the data that's been collected. Actually, you're the second, maybe the third research mentor that I've had this conversation with over the last six to 12 months, which is around an understanding what the data actually means and bringing in that, an expert view because sometimes you're expecting X, Y and Z and actually somebody comes with a critical eye. Someone used it before, I'm not sure which one of you guys did, but critical friend who says, wait a sec, stop, I think you've got it. Just stop and think about the implication of it. And, and, and one of my observations, I've, I've been reading some of the draft reports which are going to end up being in the final report, and one of them, and I won't name the product and I won't name the organisation, has an incredibly complex measure of learner outcomes. And you look at it and you go, on the surface, no one's going to understand that. When you get into the product, you get it. And then there's a component of connecting that research into the marketing story, into the narrative, and I, I talked about it earlier as well, and I think there's a really interesting piece there. But I'll come back, for a, back to our, our run sheet that we've um, thought about. I know we're going to do it at the end, but I'm going to jump in now because I think it's it fits, which is what, what would be the biggest change that you would make having worked with those three teams? What would you have changed? Make it a marathon, not a sprint. I don't okay. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to disagree, but that's okay. <laughs> um, I think it would have been getting the partners to be more involved in the beginning. You mean the education partners? They're themselves. partners of our, of our companies that, that were involved yes. in this. Yep. So I feel like often my teams were trying to get the partners to catch up with what the objectives were. And so maybe having a joint set of objectives, and I, I don't know possibly that was able to have happened with other teams, but building those up front would have led to a greater understanding of the importance of actually getting as much of that data as they could. And just to touch on again, not getting that data, it, it doesn't mean it was a failure. In fact, it made people more innovative in their use of their existing resources. But it also, not, not having an answer doesn't mean that research has failed. And I think that was a big learning for most of my teams. Nobody got 100% of what they said at the beginning in template one. This is what we're going to do by the end. Well, perfect worlds don't exist. and it never means it's failed. So getting that understanding, I think, working with the partners at the beginning, though, would have helped to 
track through a little bit more about, okay, well, you said that we would get this information from your student cohort. We don't have access to that. If you don't give that to us, then this is what might be the outcome. I, again, I think that's a really important point, Rebecca, which is uh, many commercial companies approach Pilot as, be really, let's be really blunt, can we get a sale, right? Like, am, can you deploy this and we'll get a sale at the end? And depending upon who runs the pilot, and in my experience over 20 years, it's almost always someone in the sales team. And I would strongly encourage you to think about putting into your product team, people who don't have sales targets, people who don't have metrics to deliver, because it's actually part of your product refinement process, is my view, right? It helps you think about what it is. By all means, your marketing team 100% need to be involved, because they're gonna be the ones who generate the commercial return from the work. And can we go back to sprint versus marathon for a second? Because I think this is a really important uh, opposite end of a spectrum, which is actually not that diametrically opposed. So give me the argument as to why we need to do the three year controlled, uh, um, control group managed implementation, and I'll give you the argument as to why we did it in six months. Okay, I'll, t I'll take you back from three years and just put it down to maybe one and a half. All right, well, most researchers <laughs> want to extend it out for the tenure of two new research assistants. So I'm, I'm happy with that in months. I can live closer with that one. Well, right. I think for EdTech particularly, it allows you the opportunity to work with your partners to test it through different cohorts of students because just sprinting it out, pushing it out to one cohort, maybe one unit in a, a teaching period or one institution doesn't give you such, in my opinion, such a wholesome response to the efficacy of your product. It tells you in a, in a locale, yes it worked, no it didn't, we need to refine this, we need to change this. So by extending it out, you can actually test the efficacy of your tool in a far, far broader context, which will, from my experience previously, actually mean that you will produce more development opportunities for yourself because your um, your clients, your stakeholders will be more varied and the product requirements will be more complex. Okay. I, I think I get the idea of an extended period. I really get that. I, my counter argument to this is what I call action research, right? So you want to actually begin the conversation. And I think the one piece that people need to be cognizant of is building an engaged project plan with your education partners right up front to define what we're going to do what you're going to do and what they're going to do and we agree with it and the higher you get into the institution whether it's a school or a university or a TAFE or a workforce provider the stronger the point of doing that. The reason we did a sprint is really two, two, twofold. The first one is we wanted to deliver it within a time frame that could give the companies some outcome without scaring them off because as soon as you start saying to entrepreneurs can you dedicate it two people to this for the next three years or the next 18 months, it's, it's hard to make the business case decision for it. But I hope, and actually in fact this is the really big hope here, the hope is that those companies got something beyond the funded component of the EdTech Innovation Alliance 2022 model that they say actually we do need to do this piece, we do need to do the build it into our, pro into our program. And I'll share an incredibly simple story with you. One of the largest pure play tech companies in the world, Renaissance Learning, saw this 20 something years ago and built a completely separate company called the Renaissance Academic Institute on the side and they did a whole bunch of research and they ended up with a couple of hundred researchers working full time with them and a whole research body because that was actually the thing that changed their commercial implementation. So I've got no doubt about it. But let's come back to the EdTech Innovation Alliance for a moment. We've talked in broad terms the role. We've talked a little bit about the sort of refinement process that's happened the way, all the way through. Um, it's not going to be hard to work out who we're talking about because of the sprints you did, but nicely we've got three, so we can, we can, we can um, be a little bit, um, until we've put the final research report, it can be a little bit um, de-identified. Of the three, right? You made me pick a favourite child. No, 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 of course. <laughs> no, I'm not asking you to pick that. I'm asking you to think about what were the characteristics of those teams that got a 
great outcome versus a not great outcome? And do you think that there was something different about the way they approached it? Because I want people to think about what made a model work. Uh, I think all of my teams had a great outcome for different reasons. Yeah, all right. I don't want you to rank them from one to three. <laughs> They'd be fine, but I don't need it. Well, I think it, again, depended on their individual objectives, and everybody was here for a different reason. And growth for one of my teams was enormous, but on the flip side of that... Growth of what, sorry? Their product. OK. So the, the extension of their market evolved enormously as a result of this sprint. However, they did deal with a lot of problems in the initial rollout of their first cohort. So we had to work through those and determine what they were going to do to counterbalance that to get to the end in a successful manner. Whereas other teams, they were successful, their products went through, they saw great results, they had great satisfaction. But I would say that some of the positive elements that were wins for them was that they understood how to now use their data as an ongoing method. And I know that one of my teams, when I saw their final mapping of their objectives to their data, I, I was so proud. <laughs> and it was beautiful and they'd really suddenly clicked and understood, oh my God, we have all this stuff already and we're gonna now use this with our clients. So that's a win because what they're doing is taking their product out there did, did any of them bring external data points into their project? Like ABS data or, or any, other, uh, any other data from other places? For no, ju purposes? just from partners, you okay. know, but the, the maybe extended data that the partners had. But that win, I think, allows people to sell their product in a way that has demonstrated the efficacy, but can also bring things for partners. So one of these companies will now be going and if they're, once they've built their framework, we'll be able to say, if you partner with us, not only will we bring you great, great results because of our product, but actually we can test certain things for you as a result of the data points we've embedded in our tools and our systems, and we've tested them, and they've worked, and where they failed, we've refined it. And a lot of people will want that because it saves them the time. You know, not everyone can afford Michael. So, <laughs> <laughs> and as he said, people contact professors at universities all the time and say, can you give us your time to do this? And now what the companies can do is say, we know how to do this. We've been upskilled in this. We are empowered in order to know what these data points can do. Give us your data and we will give you these results. So it's more than the product. Throughout the rest of the day, we're going to hear from each of the stakeholder groups to think about what they thought the value was. Um, I'd like you to think about what you thought the value was for the researchers in the program. For me, it was speaking with such varied teams. So each of the, the three products were very different that I was working with. One of them is in my area of research, so that was a direct connection for me, and the other two weren't at all. So I got huge learnings out of it. Uh, I also saw the different ways that different partners worked and different ways that communications worked. Uh, I was amused to hear of some of the stories. Um, we shared a lot of laughs, I think. Um, and there was a real sense of working together in connection. I, I often didn't feel like I was just a research mentor who was checking in or keeping them in line. I was working with them on the project without doing any of the work. I get it. Um, and final question, final question to, to, to leave with is, um, have any of them asked you to stay on and do more work? And are they putting you on an advisory board? Are they, what's going on here? I, this is the beast that I think ed tech companies need to think about. No, but I am available for consultation. <laughs> it, it's a genuine comment. I, I genuinely think that there are some teams. There's one particular that I met with all three actors. I met with the re lead researchers, I met with the EdTech entrepreneurs, the project manager and the EdTech uh, research mentor. And the very clear thing for me, the absolute clear thing for me is if that company wants to change their profile over the next three to five years, they should go and engage that research mentor on their advisory board or an academic board. They, it, it's, I know we joked about it before about the cost. For those of you who are in sales and marketing, 
for less than a cost of sponsoring a coffee cart for three days at Edutech or putting your brand as a principal partner for Ascoli, Co, blah, 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 you and University of Australia, you will get a significantly bigger output by having a researcher from a, from a leading research institution on your advisory board, whether it's an academic one or not, and you'll get a much longer term thing. That's my plug. And David, I think that's an important point because one of my teams actually at the end ended up getting a business analyst on board just to complete the final reports. And it was interesting to me that they could source that cash instantly to, in order to do this, but it wasn't, hadn't previously been an ongoing thought that this is something that is needed. Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. I'm guilty of all of those above. So um, that's our point where we're going to leave our scene setting, setting up what the project was and our researchers. We're going to have break for lunch now. It's being sort of put out there, so I think they're probably a few minutes behind where I'm at. So thank you all for this morning. We're going to come back at 1 o'clock. Someone's taken my... There's a 1,000 run streets, Jonathan. You've taken mine. <laughs> I think it's back at 1 o'clock, but um, a reminder of bathrooms there, tea, coffee and food there. Thanks very much. Thank you very much, Rebecca. So why don't, whilst people are doing their final, going to the bathroom, setting up phones, da 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 why don't we get started again? Welcome back and uh, into those in the room and also those joining us online. Hope you managed to meet some new people that you may not have met and the, the numbers are getting a light on, so we'll push on. A reminder that you can jump into the conversation online if you want to. There is a group of people online that are talking. So our next session is really going to start to drive into what the impact of the program was on actual learners. So we've got Dom from Intern Match somewhere with us. There we are, Dom. Hi, how are you? And we've got Steph Wood. I think Richard Wilson, unfortunately, has a uh, PCR test he's waiting on, so he's not joining us. So, Dom, why don't you come up? Dom is the co-founder of Intern Match, helping to solve the global employability problem by placing interns into internships on behalf of education providers. He's a serial entrepreneur who is always happy to give guidance to new founders. And I just met someone who's a new founder who wanted some help. So. Grab Don as well. Let's raise ten and a half million dollars. So they know what they're doing. Um, I'll over to you, Don. Thanks very much. Thanks, David. And um, very, very happy to be here. And also um, very excited that we were part of this terrific program. We certainly got a lot out of it. So joining me today, we have um, Steph Wood, who is the brand uh, marketing lead at Ziplet, which I'll ask you to join us. Come along. Hello. Yeah. Hello. Okay. Can you hold this side? I only work on, I've only got one side to me. Welcome. Hi, hi everyone. Uh, it's, it's not working. No. Push it. Can we have another one? It's yeah. Oh no, I think I just need to hold it down. No. Wonderful, while well, we sort that out. Um, it's a little bit about, a little bit about um, me and my business. So uh, seven years ago, uh, we decided to address the employment um, problem of university students making that transition from education into employment. And we do that via internships. And over the past seven years, um, we have now placed, you know, probably... Uh, well over 12,000 uh, interns into internships on behalf of universities. And we are now working uh, in the UK, also in South Africa. And because of this program that we participated in, we are now also in Canada, Vancouver, with uh, a person on the ground and two universities signed up. And, uh, but the product that we went in there was Mentor Match. And because what we realised was that those students who were doing internships that also had a mentor got better employment outcomes and also were able to connect with community. And so that's where Mentor Match was born. So, uh, and that was the product that we put through this program. So Steph, why don't you introduce yourself and tell us a little bit about your business and your role in the program. Sure, thanks Tom. Um, so I'm Steph Wood. I am the brand marketing lead at Ziplet. Um, I've been working in education for quite a long time before uh, before I joined Ziplet, but um, it's been exciting to 
work in edtech, from work in a startup particularly. Um, Ziplet is a student to teacher feedback tool. So we operate um, for individual teachers as well as um, in schools and in tertiary institutions. Um, it's a really simple concept that really enables teachers to gather authentic and um, actionable feedback in real time quite quickly um, with from their students on a range of topics and it's quite a broad use tool so it has a lot of applications depending on the context in which the teacher is using it. Um, teachers can then respond and reply to that feedback, dig a little deeper and just get a, a, bit, of a, a bit of a better view um, on how their classroom is, is going and operating and where they can um, offer a little bit more support. Terrific and, and in particular we're going to be um, talking about learner impact and what we've learnt um, from those uh, that were using uh, the platforms during the program. And so um, the first question I wanted to ask you, Steph, is why you? Why would they put a marketing person in part of this program? Well, I would have thought one of the data analysts or something would, would be... Maybe I am a data analyst <laughs> as well. Uh, well, there's, you know, there's a lot of data in marketing, so I'm, uh, I'm not unfamiliar with, with data analysis, but um, I think marketing is, you know, it's a pretty broad a pretty broad um, topic when you think about the way that we communicate with both the, the business and then we're also that sort of conduit with the market as well. So there was a connection between what is it that the market wants from us and how can we best provide that. Um, and it sort of made sense for then the person to be communicating the outcomes. I think all of us here working with the, the companies that participate in this project, you know, we wanted to be able to communicate effectively the outcomes that we saw from the project. Um, and marketing is usually uh, the one tasked with that uh, communication. And, uh, and so it made sense for us to work. I also work quite closely with a lot of our teachers and a lot of individual users. So it was um, a nice way to kind of connect the dots between what we were doing out in the market and, and what our product needed to deliver to make that happen. Wonderful. And um, normally I would go to Richard, who isn't here. So I'll talk a little bit more about um, our involvement as well. Um, and f from my point of view, um, as a founder, I got involved um, because I wanted to oversee it because I, I don't know much about data and this was something new to me. However, not knowing a lot about data and I'm not educated in that area, um, I'm more on the strategy side, the first thing I did do, which I think was, um, which was a good call by me, was that I got a data analyst involved. And there was a young lady, we eat our own dog food in our business, um, a lady who did an internship who uh, did actuarial studies and knew a lot about data. Uh, I got her involved right from the get-go, and she worked extremely well with our research professor, who I'd love to thank, um, Professor Chia. I can never remember her surname. We'll Adachi. Adachi, a lovely lady who really did help us uh, to narrow our focus more than anything else, because we were way, way too broad when we first went into this, and that was a, a real key learning for us. But having put Micah, um, who is an international student, who is who we tend to cater to, Getting her involved with her expertise, I think uh, it also assisted in um, driving a really good outcome for us. So if we move on now to, um, uh, to what we wanted to get out of the program. Steph, when you came into this, what did you wish to get out of the program? Uh, and, well, that's the question. That's the question. Yeah. Um, that is a good question. Yeah. Well, the, the application of Ziplet is incredibly broad and it's really for teachers to decide how they want to apply it to their teaching concept to their teaching context. Um, it works in, in fun ways, so teachers can ask fun icebreaker kind of questions, um, conduct little polls, relationship building type stuff, what's your best superpower, that sort of thing. Um, but there's also um, the ability for teachers to check in on comprehension, run formative assessment checks. Um, we've got a really strong bank of questions that teachers can choose from around social emotional learning um, and wellbeing and how they can best support their students in that way. Um, you know, growth mindset, there's a, there's a lot of applications. So then we needed to go, right, this is super broad. How, how do we want to measure and define what we're going to measure as, as learning impact? You know, it's tricky. Yep. And, and so were you measuring things um, uh, with ratings or was it? Well, we're, we have this, um, this ability to ask questions within our application. So we have, we're our questioning app. We can ask questions of the students. We can ask questions of the teachers. So we had um, a really, really, purposeful tool almost for this kind of application where we can have quantitative and qualitative data. Um, but the, the challenge for us, I suppose, in, in running a research project was, okay, what is, the, what is the metric of success in terms of a learning outcome? 
um, and we had to, to narrow that one down and to work. And we were really lucky to have a strong academic partner to help us um, to help us refine what that meant. And then um, I think I was listening earlier when we were talking about those subjectives. You know, we thought we thought big. We'd love to see how this product can impact teacher teacher practice and improve teachers' practice by asking questions of their students, gathering feedback from their students around where they require uh, support or whatever that may be. Um, but then also, how do teachers, how do students and learners feel and engage? Or do they feel engaged in their in their classroom by responding to teachers' feed, to teachers' questions? Um, so that was sort of our broad our broad objective. Um, but yeah, it, it became more narrow as the as the pro, as the time went on because those are pretty big as well. So yeah, and and, and we faced that same issue that we were so broad, mm. and um, uh, our research professor helped us narrow that down. For us, um, we really did want to get some measures in place. We had this hypothesis that um, mentees uh, get a lot out of mentoring, and that has been our observation, but we had no hard evidence of that, and we really wanted to use it for marketing. And also as a tool to um, provide to those education providers to convince them to use our services. Mm. Um, so we did a lot of work with ratings. And we, uh, for every single mentoring session that the students had, we asked both the mentee and the mentor to provide a rating out of five. And we would jump on anyone where there was a, uh, a difference of more than two. So if the mentee was saying that the mentor session, uh, the mentorship session that they had was, say, two out of five, but the mentor, of course, put five out of five because they were excellent, uh, then we would jump all over it and find out what was going on and what was happening. Uh, the results were that the majority of, um, of uh, mentorship sessions uh, averaged between four and a half and five out of five, uh, which was good, but we learnt more from those that did come back with two and, and one out of five because there were issues there. Uh, that we needed to jump all over. So uh, we were actually hoping we would get more negative outcomes so we could learn more, because you learn the most from those. Uh, it didn't work out that way, uh, but we did learn a Is few everyone, other things. Everyone was happy? Everyone was happy, not all the time, but, uh, <laughs> but as we went along. Um, uh, what did you learn from the efficacy study that you participated in? Ah, um, well, we, we learned a lot. There's, uh, is there anything more specific or just it, generally? Well, it, well, it, well, I liken it to expected learnings and unexpected learnings. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, well, I think one of the things that we learned um, in the schools that we worked with was that, you know, teachers are, are busy people. We've kind of run a similar kind of research project a little bit like this before in a different scenario where all the teachers uh, were actively participating in uh, in the in the research. This was a little bit of a different scenario. We introduced the product into the schools um, and we kind of encouraged them to participate in the research. And of course, there was a variety of, of teachers who were busy or who didn't, um, who weren't quite so keen and those who were working. And then we had to kind of make adjustments for our research outcomes based on the participation levels. So there was a pretty big learning gap and there was a lot of sort of extenuating circumstances around timing that made um, made that a little bit harder. And I think that that is just one of those wonderful things that helps you in the future when you run further um, research because it does impact data when you have, um, you know, you have a variety of kind of uh, engagement levels with what you're trying to do. Um, but one of the sort of unexpected learnings, I suppose, was um, working out of, we worked with a school in, uh, in Northern Ireland, in Londonderry, uh, and it's called Foyle Secondary College. They were a really great research partner. Um, but you know, we, we haven't really, well, let me, let me rephrase. We have a couple of ways that we offer the um, Ziplet to, to the market. We have a, a free teacher. Um, the teachers can just kind of sign up and use it in, in their own context at their own will. Um, and we have a heap of, uh, or actually the majority of our users are, are global. So there are a lot, of, uh, a lot in the US and all over the world. Um, but our clients have mostly been based in Australia thus far. So this was the first real um, foray into working with a school uh, on the other side of the planet. Um, and there was a lot to learn from that. It was incredibly helpful to kind of figure out how we could best support the teachers to support their students to create that impact that we were looking for or that we would hope to see. And that the real key for us with our with um, with generating learner impact is to have teachers grab it and go and to start asking questions and to generate feedback. You know, there's a lot of research out there already in the market that says that student to teacher feedback. 
um, can increase and enhance learning outcomes. You know, that's a, that's a John Hattie special right there. But it's um, for us to then go out and prove that. We need the teachers to, to jump in and give it a try and give the students the chance to, to, to provide some feedback and to, to be more involved in that process. Cool. And a question without notice, because mm. we rehearsed this earlier, not that you can tell. Um, did the, like, we really struggled with um, the different terms of uh, timetables oh, from yeah. overseas. Was that yeah. an issue for you, given it was such a short sprint? Yeah, absolutely. So, um, I mean, the Northern Ireland, they they went back to school in 4th of January, I believe. Yep. <laughs> and we were all just in our post-Christmas haze. Um, and then the, the school in, in Australia that we worked with started a little bit later. So, yep. and, the, you know, and conversely, the, the Northern Ireland school, they, they were wrapping up in May. Um, yep. So the, there was definitely, I guess, challenges in comparing the kind of data that we had from one school to another just in that timing. And, and that would support uh, if this was done again, and I hope it is done again because I think uh, it's been extremely valuable, having uh, the sprint go a little bit longer. Mm. Mind you, I'm a big supporter of having it shorter because it forced us to do things we wouldn't do as quickly. Yeah, like what? Like, um, it forced us to go into Vancouver. We needed to find um, someone, it forced the conversation, it forced us to get a person on the ground um, because out of this we picked up a contract to do um, uh, internship placements with them as well. It just forced us to into action, and hence why. And again, entrepreneur um, that started 20 businesses in my life. Ten were rubbish, so I shut them down. But <laughs> six were good, so I sold them. And I'm working on four. I like to do things really quickly, so the short sprints really suited, you know, me as an entrepreneur. Well, that's. I mean, wow. <laughs> <laughs> that's a mouthful. Um, a couple of other things. Um, but one thing that we noticed also um, was that. When it comes to mentoring, the students that were forced into mentoring were rubbish. And they didn't engage, didn't want to be part of it, found every excuse, and it was just a terrible outcome. Um, the student, and we didn't even, we didn't get them to start. It was impossible to get them even to start. Um, uh, whereas the students who volunteered, they self-selected themselves, were incredible, extremely engaged, and it was a better outcome. So now we need to think about, well, if we go into a school, if we do uh, if the school enforces them to have a mentor, we know that that's not going to be the best um, outcomes. The other one too was that we always had this hypothesis that we wanted the mentee, the student, to make first contact with the mentor because we wanted them to drive the relationship. Disaster. Um, all the kids, uh, you know, a lot of them were very, very shy and, and used, again, every excuse under the sun not to contact someone because they felt uncomfortable doing it. Um, whereas the mentors who then took the initiative to um, contact the mentees directly, it was a terrific outcome. And there was one final one, and that was that our tech was rubbish. Um, it fell over. And so, um, again, this was a quick sprint that we needed to do quickly. Our tech wasn't up to it. Uh, we tried to put it out there, it didn't work, it fell over, so we had to go to a fully um, manual um, process. And that was even a really good learning for us because the outcomes were still incredibly valuable. And so um, that proved to us that there was value in what we were doing. And it actually didn't matter whether we were using um, a, a manual process or a tech-based process. Um, and so imagine how good it's going to be once we do get tech that can drive this really well. How's that going, the tech development? It's getting better. A nice. um, couple of people may have lost their jobs along the way, <laughs> but, um, but anyway, we'll, we'll sort that out. Um, Long-term impact. Uh, what, what were some of the things that you've learned uh, that you'll be applying into your business for the long term through this program? Um, we, I mean, I think we sort of doubled down on, on the concept, because I think, you know, this session is a little bit about learner impact and, and the long-term learner impact. Um, and we know that with, with use and with sort of consistent and regular feedback that there is an impact for learners. Learners feel more, um, more able to ask for help if they need it, especially in this uh, sort of more progressively digital world. There's a lot less comfort for, for students to offer or sort to ask for support or to to say if they need um, something that, that you know that they're not currently getting um, by by providing sort of a safe place for that teachers can get a really great kind of picture of what's what's going on with their students um, but one of the challenges I think that we find is that um, teachers you know they 
they need to, it, we, we affect learners by affecting teachers, so we need to kind of be able to Im influence and impact teachers to kind of jump in, get started and realise the simplicity of the concept. Um, and we tried a few different sort of methods and I think globally the, the ways of communicating with teachers is different. Um, I know we've had some, some, um, some companies that we've worked with in the US who are like, you need to be text messaging teachers, which is not something that we would have ever sort of considered. Mm. Um, we send a lot of emails, but there's also, you know, we want to be able to, to, to get that attention and to do that at the right time and to say the right things that will in, instigate that kind of that action, which will, you know, at the end of the day is how, like I said, how we can impact learner outcomes. Um, you know, it's a pretty broad, um, a broad topic when we say, you know, student engagement or we say um, teacher practice, but at the end of the day, we look at the qualitative responses that we receive from some of the teachers around things that they learn from their students that would help them to make changes in their classroom. And you can see that impact there. You can see that if by doing that, they're going to, they're going to learn more about how they can improve what they're doing and vice versa. Students felt more, much more comfortable providing feedback after doing it for however long, you know, like one term, one and a half terms, I think we did it for. Yep. Um, so, you know, I think it just sort of reaffirmed that it's there, but there's so many nuances to how we can continue to improve it and particularly to be able to export um, and do this in a global, in a global way. How do we, uh, or, and how do we support schools in international markets without putting someone on the ground? Yeah. How can we do that smoothly? Um, and so that everyone has sort of got the resources that they need to kind of get started. And will you be continuing to um, uh, embed practices that uh, you did during the program into your product? Absolutely, particularly yeah. in supporting international clients. So, like I said, our clients currently are Australian-based, um, and supporting you know the school leaders to to use the platform and then encourage their department heads or faculties or whatever that may be, um, because it's there's a lot of conflicting priorities for teachers. And I think we all know that. Um, and by implementing something you know smoothly school wide and straight away, we've got um, we've got a, that much more um, you know chance at success with with having that learner impact at the end of the day. Terrific, and, and we will be too. A big um, a big thing for us is that we will continue to um, uh, provide the surveys after every single mentoring session forever because the data is just so valuable and uh, we've shown that already. So I think by the end of this year, we need to deliver 2,367 mentoring sessions between now and Christmas, and we will have data on every single one of those. And that data is uh, gonna be so valuable for us, but also for the education providers as well. So we can't, we can't thank you know, everyone enough um, for pushing us down uh, this path in this program, uh, because I think it's contributed uh, enormously uh, to our business. And, and value of the project for your business? Well, I mean, I think it's, it's hard to say, yeah, no, let, me, let me rephrase that. Research is um, so important in education. I think there's a lot of products and services that you purchase and you don't really need to see or hear research backing for that product. Um, but we are working really hard and a big part of why I participated personally helped to this project is because a big part of our marketing is to be able to say, well, yes, we have been you know, tested or we have researched this, we have research that has been written by others that is backing up the concept, the broader concept of feedback, but also we've conducted our own research and we hope to continue to conduct our own research. Um, another element of the, of the project that was sort of an unexpected result uh, that we saw was that we were um, assessed by the uh, Education Alliance Finland, and they, you know, said that we had really excellent pedagogical quality against the CASEL framework, which is a, the most renowned social and emotional learning framework. So having these sorts of um, certifications and research backing, it's all really important marketing in, in ed tech and in education. We can't just make baseless claims about our efficacy. Um, so in terms of you know making sure that the impact that we expect to see with our learners is actually something that we have seen in a, in a, in a way that um, has had you know some, some research 
guidelines and structures around it, because it is hard to test this sort of thing, um, particularly with a variety of learners, a variety of age groups, a variety of learning contexts. Um, but having um, Amber working with us, that our education, um, sorry, our academic partner, she really helped us kind of dig down and refine what it is that we want to understand about how our product works. And you can't, I mean, I don't think that's something that you can say is a pretty easy thing for most small startups to be able to, to grab onto a research project and just undertake it off their own bat. Like, to have the funding, to have um, the partners, to have the support of edu growth, like, that's an, it's an invaluable, um, an invaluable process. Yeah, I, I, I've got my um, uh, views on that, which I'll share in a moment, but tell me about the the contribution that EduGrowth made um, to the program? Uh, well, I mean, I think EduGrowth just put the, the structures in place to make sure that everyone was um, going about things in, the, in a similar way, yep. right? And then also we had the check, re really regular check-ins, yep. but they really made it a supportive environment. If you need, if we needed to make adjustments to the to the timeline, or sorry, to the research to the timeline, it was uh, it was really about helping us become better researchers, which I don't think was quite well. I don't I don't think that was actually an expect an expectation at the beginning yeah. that that was what was going to be happening. But the the process of working with um, an academic, but then to really refine our own. Um, abilities to 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 find research outcomes that we'd like to see expected expect, expected outcomes. Yep. Um, you know that that support from edu growth that wrapped around the whole program is um, yeah it was it would wouldn't have worked without it. Yeah, I, I totally agree. And it sounds like you had um, uh, support from edu growth that was um, you know when, that you could change things yeah. if you needed to. Yeah. Ours wasn't like that at all. Our guy just rang us up all the time and said, "Do things we hadn't done." So they pushed us to make sure that we stuck to the to the timelines. And again, I'm the type of person that needs that. Otherwise, you know, things get um, you know other things are more important, and we just let them go. So, whereas the researcher was there to help us um, come up with all the questions and refine what we're doing, all that type of thing, Edge of Growth really made sure that we stayed uh, on track. And and I think it wouldn't have been. Uh, as successful for us if we didn't have that push. So thank you, Luke, for uh, for doing that. Yes, Luke, Luke certainly did ring a bit. Yeah, he, he, <laughs> he, he helped a lot. Um, uh, that's all I had. Was there anything else you wanted to, to say about the program? No, I think we're, um, are, are we throwing to Q&A? Yes, Q&A. Yeah. We've got six minutes of yeah. Q&A, which uh, will open it to the floor to ask us some questions. Um, if we go back to learners for a second, there are 4,100 learners impacted here. I don't know in each of your projects how many were, were impacted. But what's the next step for them? What happens in those education institutions that you've been working with and those 4,100 learners? What's the next step? Um, well, we're still working with the two education partners that we ran the research project with. They um, opted to continue on with our platform, which is uh, very promising, in my opinion, um, despite the fact that I was quite annoying um, throughout the program, you know, in, in, I was annoying, you know, in, in trying to deliver the research and making sure that we received or that we got all the things that we needed and that everything happened. Um, I, I was really pleased to hear that they were still going to work with us, and I think Given the structures that we had in place around the research project, um, the teachers saw a really wide variety of applications for the product. And as I said, we don't see learner impact unless we see um, teacher impact. So for us, we like to think that having the ability for students to become more comfortable in providing feedback to their teachers and in seeking the support that they need, they have a stronger potential for um, you know, for their well-being to be supported more, for their, um, for them to do better in assessments because they've had that ch those constant check-ins prior to those assessments. You know, these are all these are all things that I'd like to see, but I think that that's the the potential that we're offering now to those learners um, in the future. And, and for us. Um when the tech fell over, we thought it was an absolute disaster and we'd failed everything, but it was interesting that uh, when we switched to the manual mode, um, they, everyone really got a lot of benefit out of it, so much so that um, the university in Canada uh, now wish to expand the program uh, through their uni next year. So we're just um, putting the final touches on that contract to do it. We also picked up another uni. And for Mentor Match, which was an initiative that was born out of another um, terrific government program called Civic Labs, part of Launch Vic. 
I mean, this little business or this part of our business is only about 12 months old and it will turn over a million dollars worth of revenue. Um, a lot of it export revenue um, in this financial year. So we, again, we've got a lot to thank um, about these initiatives, um, but also the people on the other end are getting a lot out of it as well, otherwise they wouldn't bother participating. So um, yeah, good learnings all, all around. Well, join me in thanking Dom and Steph for talking to us about the most important stakeholder, which is the 4,100 um, actual learners who impacted through the EdTech Innovation Alliance, the 165 educators, the 11 researchers from across 13 countries. So any project, if you've ever run a project that's more than a couple of weeks old, goes through ebbs, flows, peaks, troughs, utter despair, huge adula, uh, um, uh, excitement. And this project's no different. And a key component of the EdTech Innovation Alliance was to connect EdTech entrepreneurs with leading academics that invariably raise some incredibly big questions and things to think about. I'd like to sort of now move and start thinking and hearing from the sprint teams about what these challenges did for them, how they rethought their product, how they rethought their approach, how they made some changes. So I'm going to welcome Rowan, Gianni and Melinda to come and talk to us about what success looked like and how they changed. Over to you guys. Someone else did it. Magic. I've been dobbed in to facilitate this one. Hi everybody, I'm Rowan. Um, I'm Head of Product for IntelliSchool. Um, we have Gianni, who's Director of Customer Engagement for GenX Ventures. And we have Melinda, hi Melinda. <laughs> uh, project Manager for Business Analyst at Lex. And based on the introduction there, I feel like you were talking about our sprint fairly squarely. We experienced some challenges. Um, and that's what we're talking about, how we were able to, uh, we, we certainly experienced some challenges, but what we did with that challenge to try and find some success. Um, setting the scene, um, would you, Melinda, would, uh, would you mind sharing a bit about your role within the Innovation Alliance? Yep, no worries. Um, so I'm a project manager with Adelex and we have a platform called Credentialate which is a credential evidence platform. Now we wanted to roll this out to a couple of new markets as part of this project. So I project managed both the project and those rollouts um, for our company and it was amazing to work with partners from all over the place. So we had partners in America, North America, partners here in Melbourne, um, and we had a third partner actually, so we had three partners. We had a partner who was a subject matter expert in credentialing. So yeah, that's what we did for our project and it was quite large. Johnny? Sure. Um, with regards to challenges, mine came day one. Um, <laughs> I got uh, involved six weeks after the commencement of this engagement. Uh, my handover typically was for five minutes and I said, by the way, you can have a meeting with a researcher today. And I got told that um, the research will be doing bulk of the researching and I'll just be sitting back doing very little and to be told by the research, in fact, you're going to be doing all the work. So um, that was interesting and, and was a bit of a laugh. But uh, now to give you a bit of background, Gen X are excellent in the development piece but do very poorly or do nothing at all in the research part. So this is a whole new thing for us. So it was a big learning curve. Um, my role was to be the conduit between GenX and the EIA team being Luke and obviously the researcher and obviously whittle down to the team what the expectations are from this program and my expectation of them to be able to, for us to deliver on the uh, deliverables and the milestones, etc. Thanks. We, similarly to you, I, I'd started at IntelliSchool the week before uh, we did our application, um, uh, but it was, we felt strongly that we should be a part of this. Um, where uh, IntelliSchool does K-12 analytics and we, we had a strong presence in the uh, domestic market um, uh, and we were sort of on the verge of uh, trialling some different kinds of analytics in some international markets and thought this would be the perfect opportunity to trial those new features. Um, I, upon reflection, incredibly ambitious, um, but certainly we did learn a lot. Um, uh, to the next question, um, setting out for success, uh, establishing aims for a project with multiple partners uh, requires negotiation and flexibility. Uh, and you may have distinctive goals, but uh, we also have to accommodate the, the goals of our partners. Um, Melinda, this question's for you. 
you're working with three partners on your project, the Education Design Lab, UniMelb, and the University of Dayton. Um, how did you negotiate the goals with those partners and how did it shape your innovation sprint? Yeah, that's a really tough question to answer succinctly, um, but I'll give it a go. So each of our partners shared our goals of testing the learner efficacy of our product um, and that made it easy in some respects. So we were all on the same wavelength. Um, the difficulty was obviously that each institution had its own goals as well as that. So they also wanted to do individual research projects. That kind of um, touched on our project as well. So we combined all of that together. And that meant that it actually went really smoothly for us. I know we're talking about pivot for success here and we're talking about you know what some of the challenges were, but I think even though our partners were unique and had their own needs, it gelled together so well that we ended up working not as you know a partner in North America or a partner in Australia in an ed tech company. We worked as a group of people who had one goal. Um, one of our biggest challenges was narrowing down our objectives, and Rebecca can speak to this a lot. We had a list of objectives about as long as our arm, and we had to basically pare that down so that we had a research project that we could wrangle into some sort of six-month time frame with a report at the end that answered all of the objectives of all of the partners. So we were told at the start that we were ambitious um, <laughs> and we went, nah, it'll be fine. It's just a research project, you know, with, you know, a couple of institutions and a couple of surveys. And then when we started actually using the framework from Deakin and applying that to our objectives, we went, oh, we've got way too much here. We've got a huge project on our hands that could take two years. So long and the short of it is that we worked with our partners to narrow down our objectives, to get a research project that was actually completable in the time frame that we needed it to be completed and gave us the answers that we were looking for. So I, that was some of our challenges and because our partners were um, so wonderful and such experts in their field and they knew exactly what they wanted to drive out of this project and they wanted to drive it together, it worked really well. Quick follow up. When you talk about your partners, I, I assume you mean your, your, the education partners that you worked with. To what extent was the partnership that you had with your academic mentor sort of key to working through scope? Yeah, it was incredibly key because what we were doing was we were working out the efficacy of our product for their learners. So they were the best people to inform us about what their learners needed. Sure. Johnny, uh, you had experience with multiple partners as well. What key takeaways did you have? Uh, yeah, so uh, our three partners were locally based um, and in UK or in China. Um, and I guess in parallel working with them, we're also creating a, our first ever research framework. So the key takeaways for us was, firstly, we really had to understand what we want to achieve out of this. Um, as I mentioned, we, we, had a, we had a second start to this program when I joined. So once we understood what our goals were, we had to translate that so our partners understood what we wanted to achieve. And obviously the data that we wanted to get out of from them to help us make those final decisions as to the success of the actual project. So it was really important for us to um, create an engagement plan that was gonna achieve all that. Um, look, it wasn't easy. Uh, we, because of our lack of experience in the research place, we, we really struggled at front, but once, and I had wonderful guidance from, from our research and was able to help us and guide us through that process, which is really fantastic, and uh, achieved the success that we did. Um, so I think the key takeaways is, is probably sit back and understand exactly what we're sort of jumping into, and then ensuring that our partners understood what we want to achieve also. Yeah. Did, did you have an existing relationship with your international partners, or did this come about as part of this program? Yes, one of them we did, so which I'll talk about a little bit later. Yeah. All right, a loaded question, because our international partners, we, we established that partnership as part of this program and really did not have 
a strong relationship or a deep relationship with the folks at that particular school. Um, and so uh, it was quite ambitious in trying to, for us anyway, in trying to roll out a new feature with a new partner where we didn't really have an existing relationship like we did with our domestic partners. Um, and, you know, honestly, um, if it weren't for um, the, uh, for, for EduGrowth in assisting is, and us relying on their, their international networks, uh, we would have been in real trouble. Um, I guess the takeaways for me were, um, you know, scope creep of your project, make sure that you can do something that you can achieve. And secondly, um, you know, the takeaway was that um, we should have asked for help a little earlier because when we did, we found um, real benefits in that. We were able to understand markets that we hadn't even thought about ahead of time. So it's been a, a real benefit to us. The next question, all projects uh, as part of the EIA vary from inception to completion. What is shared is the need to pivot when the unexpected occurs. Having the ability to be agile and flexible can make all the difference. Johnny, you had an international partner pull out the last minute. That sounds familiar. How did you pivot to ensure the project was still successful? Yeah, a Chinese partner who we'd worked with before and knew quite well, um, March, April, obviously they got hit by their COVID lockdowns. Um, so we got the unfortunate phone call saying that they had to reprioritise a lot of their activities and had to drop ours, which we completely understood. Um, now the challenge was not only did they have the lion's share of the participants, but they were also providing the content that we needed for the solution to be tested and obviously to get the data from the various users. So. Um, we, we, we had two options, it's really to go with our existing network, but I actually suggest well, why don't we reach out to our other partners to see who they got in their network, um, because they know what we want to achieve and also introduces us to potential other customers and other partners, which fortunately uh, we got two additional partners. Um, now, the major pivot was we went down one route, a sector that we were going to pursue, purely because from a commercial success we thought it was a lowest hanging fruit. Um, but we're forced to go down another sector, which, um, you know, in hindsight, was uh, very fortunate, um, as we are now talking to um, a potential customer as far as moving from this program to a national pilot when we have a working solution. So it was um, it was a necessary pivot, but it uh, you know it was it proved to be quite fortunate. <laughs> That's amazing. It's a good outcome. Um, Linda, your your project showcased the importance of strong partnerships. Um, how did collaboration with your partners help when facing a problem? Our partners were part of the problem solving process of the project. So we faced quite a few problems. One of them being, and this is probably um, an underpinning challenge, I'd like to say, was that I'm not a researcher and I'm running a research project. And so when I have questions about research or when I need to work closely with someone in the research field, who do I turn to? Um, I had our mentor who was wonderful and helped me through the framework for the project. But as, as Rebecca said, we don't have a researcher full time on the project. So it just so turns out that two of our partners are very heavily involved in their own research. Um, one was doing a PhD in the area that we were actually doing this project in, which was quite handy. And the other one is a researcher at the University of Melbourne, which is also quite handy. So um, between their experience and Education Design Lab's Dr. Naomi Boyer's experience in the skills arena, we actually pulled together enough knowledge within our project team to overcome the hurdles that we had. And those hurdles were, how do you do a research project? Um, how do you design research instruments? How do you test efficacy? How, what questions do you ask of the learners, the employers, um, your partners themselves? What questions do you ask your partners? So all of the underpinning research theology and any issues that were that sort of surfaced around that, such as, you know, how do you get research efficacy, uh, efficacy, ethics approvals? How do you do all that sort of stuff that a project manager in IT doesn't know anything about? Um, that was our partner's 
uh, value in this project, amongst other things. I mean, obviously, they contributed a lot more than that, but one of the big values to solving problems in our project was the knowledge pooling of our partners and the amount of stuff they contributed. Um, I, I have to shout out to them here um, because this is on top of their extremely busy schedules, and I'm sure we all had partners like that who, who did this out of love and out of interest for the research part of it and what sort of data we'd get back. So they took on an enormous burden themselves on top of their already very busy lives. And um, it was through that kind of partnership and that kind of effort that we resolved many of the project hurdles and challenges that we had. Yeah, I, I echo those sentiments. Ed, our academic mentor, um, often a sort of calming influence for me and um, a bit of a, a, a guide on you know what we should be looking at. Um, we also had our international partner uh, drop out. Um, the issue was they were in, they were out, they were in and they were out over a period of months. Um, the, I guess the, the happy ending for us was um, in, in going to EduGrowth and getting assistance on finding additional partners, we went from having um, the test of a proof of concept with one potential international market uh, to three. Um, and along the way, we were able to learn a great deal about um, the educational context of those markets that we probably wouldn't have gotten to know, certainly not in the, in the period of time that we did it. So we now have a far clearer indication of where we'll take the product, the shape it will take, um, and how we position it for different markets. So it has, well, at the time it felt pretty bad that you know, we weren't progressing this thing. Um, you know, as things unfurled and unfolded, uh, it became um, obvious that this was a huge benefit and it gave us a path forward. Yeah, we had, a, we had an identical experience. We initially had um, four countries. The participants had been involved. That grew to nine, um, you know, from, from two continents to five. And all of a sudden, we had um, that, that moment where we've gone, wow, this market potential has just grown exponentially. Uh, the same problems that will happen to solve, you know, are, are replicable in all these countries. Um, and all of a sudden, and, you know, we tested in a different sector. We were going to test maybe down the line a bit in the future, but had all this information now with us and um, yeah, it's, it's, it's really buoyed us at GenX Ventures, so quite excited. Uh, research refinement. Uh, we heard earlier about the importance of product refinement, uh, in particular how the research helped refine your solution to help solve and enhan enhance learning outcomes. Um, Melinda, how has the research shaped your product moving forward? I actually, when I answered this question in my head when I got it, I was like, oh yeah, we did one change. And then I actually made a list of the things that we have done with our product following this project. And I actually have a list of six changes that I didn't realise at the time, but when I sat down and really thought about it, I went, yes, that has all been shaped from the experiences of this project. So we changed the design of our product output um, we did two major things with that. We changed both the, the look and feel of it and we changed the data that was on it so it had more meaning to the learners and was more easily usable and accessible by the learners. Um, we, I didn't even think of this. It was something we did in response to the project but we actually developed a set of public APIs for our platform. And we did that because not everybody could give us the data that we needed in the format that we were expecting. And so we just pivoted and went, OK, that's fine. We'll create some APIs and you can give us the data in a way that's meaningful for you. And we did um, an international hosting. So we hosted internationally for the first time in the USA. And we also, with the integration in um, University of Melbourne, we learned a lot about privacy impact assessments and things like that. So we changed some of our IT processes as well. And I could probably name a couple more little things that we did that I didn't even think about at the time. We just did it in response to, oh, we need to get this project done and these are the things we need to do. And now I sit back and have a look at what that's meant to us and I've realised that we've learnt our body of knowledge is, is a lot bigger now. Johnny, how did your research mentor, mentor assist you in reflecting on what data to collect and how to interpret it? Yeah, uh, Kelly was wonderful. Um, you know, once once we'd met, uh, you know, what our objectives are to to the questions that we're asking uh, the key stakeholders, and also 
the surveys that uh, the participants have populated, um, it, it, we typically went straight to the qualitative because it was a lot easier for us to interpret. Um, but with Kelly, she was able to go through some of the quantitative stuff also that actually gave us the grounding to set the path forward for how we improve the user experience from the platform. So there was some design considerations that came out of that, which you know we probably would have missed because we wouldn't have asked the right questions or we wouldn't have noticed that that data or the trends were in the data. So I think that's the absolute key bit for us. Um, which is why you know we've now got this framework with the assistance of Kelly that we never had before. Um, you know, it's not perfect for us yet, and we need to personalise it for us now for, for the next phase that we walk into. But I think I think that's the most important bit. Um, the next phase is critical for us, and we're expanded participants to in the tens of thousands. So that's when we really truly understand if we've designed it uh, correctly for the users. Yeah. Uh, we, we, just by nature of having lost participants, we had to change the design of our research project. We changed the way that we collected data on, on, um, on efficacy. Uh, we changed the groups that we were working with. Uh, I mean, Ed was instrumental in helping us really be quite dynamic in the way that we worked with our partners because we had to keep evolving it. Um, again, the benefit of, of um, sort of being quite agile in that respect and having someone to rely on like, like Ed, our academic partner, um, was that in the end um, we were able to completely reframe the way that we're going to design the product going forward and the way that we're going to position it in the market, both for the international markets that we're going to, but also the domestic market. Um, and uh, great news for us as well is, is that um, the work that we've done as part of this project has now resulted in some domestic sales of that product. Um, and I, you know, I believe that it's um, a pretty strong reflection of the way that it's been reshaped based on our involvement in That's this project. Uh, I think this is the final question for us, the, the value of the program. As we wrap up the session, let's take a moment to discuss the overall value um, uh, to each of us. Linda, um, as an end tech, what value do you put on programs like this that connect stakeholders and build the Victorian ed, ed, uh, ed tech sector? This program um, was absolutely invaluable to us. There's a number of reasons. It's been one of the reasons has been touched on a bit here. The um, speed in which this pro, well, this program slash project need to be delivered was six months, and I can tell you that if you'd given me this project and said just scope it out for us and let us know what the time frame will be, um, I probably would have come back to you and said a year and a half um, or more because of the amount of, as I said before, the amount of knowledge I thought that you know we needed to upskill on and, and it just so happened that our project team had it, so that was wonderful. But um, it forced us to, to do a research project very quickly and we probably couldn't have done that before. And the really important part of doing this research project was we'd wanted to do research on the efficacy of our platform for as long as I, I've been around this platform and we just didn't know where to start. You can't just roll up to a university usually and say, hey, can we experiment on your students, please? Can we roll out a platform and then do some surveys and you know, get in there and talk to your academia? And I'm sure that there wouldn't be many institutions that would go, sure. <laughs> so that allowed us, this program has allowed us to work with to universities and do that priceless research with their students and with the employers of those students and with the universities themselves to see how our platform's product landed. Um, and we, as I said, we'd been wanting to do that for ages. Um, working with academics was valuable in itself because we got to understand their view as well and how they, they approach learning design and, and skills recognition in programs and you don't know that as an ed tech until you actually talk to the source. We thought we knew and then we learnt some, some more things. So we didn't know everything of course. Um, really importantly is the research has stuck. So the instruments we developed for this project, the methods we developed, we're going to keep going with. We found that in six months we got some data, some really good data we'd like to keep going and get more data with different cohorts, uh, using different programs as in different um, courses within the universities. 
and expanding and collecting more and more data because one data set's obviously not going to be enough for us to hang our hat on and go, yes, this is how our product lands with our audience. So we're going to keep going. And that's amazing. Firstly, we would never have done the research and secondly, we'd, we'd never have a path forward to keep researching. So that's been, I think, our main and our massive <laughs> benefit from this. Sure. Jenny, what's been the, the, the most valuable bit for you? Yeah, so, um, so GenX for over 10 years, we've been in the business of providing a digital online assessments platform. Um, now, we've been looking uh, for quite a few years now and I ended up stalking <laughs> a gentleman by the name of Professor Hamish Coates, who's been involved in assessments for over 20 years and he's been a big proponent of the next generation assessments, so reforming how we use assessments in the education process, which effectively uh, improves the learning product productivity of the learner. Um, so we don't have we don't have a, um, a, a a solution as a whole or a platform yet. We literally have wireframes and mock-ups. So we built something of a concept that was enough for for the partners to work with to give us a feedback. You know, is this going to work? So um, so we had nothing initially, um, just an idea and a concept. Um, but what we got was an understanding that. You know, as I said earlier, that this does have legs, and not just in Australia, not just in the UK, but all over the world. Uh, there are a lot of problems it can solve. Um, and prior to the program, we didn't do anything in research, so we've now got you know a a, a framework for research. It's not quite robust. We need to improve it. I must admit. But Genix has got other solutions outside of education that we're going to be using this framework for also, which is which is quite exciting. Um, we use, you know, we, we've got now evidence-based data that we've been using when we're having conversation with customers. So it's helping us from a selling perspective. Um, but most importantly, as I mentioned earlier, when we had to sort of pivot to to using other partners, uh, one of these partners is their focus on English uh, language training. Now this was an area that we were going to pursue because um, we've already got a customer in that space, but not for another 12 to 24 months. Um, Fortunately, that partner recommended us to uh, someone in their network who happens to uh, lead uh, a top two global provider of English language training who's um, had several conversations with us and uh, waiting for us to show them a working demo. So that's forced us to propel and accelerate the development of the solution. So, I mean, it's, it's enormous for us. You know, it would effectively double or triple the business with just the one customer. So it's, big, it's quite significant. So, you know. I mean, extremely valuable. Win. Yeah, that's incredible. It's a big win. Um, we, it, similarly, we, we we had a concept uh, that we wanted to develop. Um, it was on the back burner, um, and in the six months that, or just over the six months, we're involved in this project, we went from you know something that was not even a wireframe um, to something that was real and something that we could get uh, market feedback on, and then redevelop. Um, and have a pathway to domestic and, in fact, sell it in the domestic market and have a pathway to uh, international markets as well. All of that in six months. Um, Linda, like you, had anybody asked me ahead of that, you know, could you do that, I would have said, yeah, sure, two-year time horizon. Um, uh, and I don't feel like it was mayhem. You know, it was structured. We had support. We had guidance. Um, so the value in that was, you know, we have a new product that we didn't have six months ago. I agree with you about the structure. The structure was invaluable, wasn't it? Because without that sort of constant feedback to edge growth and constant feedback mm. from our researchers, I think we would have struggled mm. within that six months mm. to find our feet. Agreed. Um, I th well, that's it from us. That's all I have. But we have three minutes. Um, any questions? <laughs> I'll ask a question from here, actually. Um, I've got a question for you, Melinda, because you've worked in higher ed, right? So all researchers are equal, but some researchers are more equal than others. So I'm interested in how you navigated the complexity of your team, a research mentor, working into with other researchers in a higher education setting. How did that go? Was it smooth as it feels like it would have been? It, <laughs> <laughs> hmm. um, no, it was smooth. Um, all researchers have their own approaches, as you know, and their own specialties in research. And luckily for us, that all gelled together for our team. So we took a little bit of everybody's opinions and everybody's methodologies and approaches 
and there were no arguments. We we tailored it to the way that we needed. And it's being I'm polite. being very I know, diplomatic. I know but the it's truth true. here. It's not as smooth as she suggests, <laughs> but we'll go with it for the public well, audience. Let's talk about the end result. <laughs> All right, that's the much important. Point. The end result was good. Um, I won't deny it. there was some friction, and mostly I, I'm going to be the owner of this. I was the probably fiction point oh, because I'm yeah. not the researcher and I was interpreting from person to person the research requirements of the project and sometimes as a non-researcher talking to researchers you don't sound that smart and that was me. So I was probably the the uh, spanner in the works there. A, a similar question to, to you as well, Gianni, not so much around the researchers in the higher education space but you, you had to bring in partners. And I think if I understood correctly, you had to pivot some of those partners. I know that Rowan did as well. H how did that process go with people who had already a pre-signed idea of what they wanted and how do you mount that into what you're trying to achieve? Oh, again, it's all about setting the expectations early and reiterating that, I think, uh, is a key thing for us. Um, once that was established, it, it was quite smooth after all that. So, yeah. Look, we, we, we were really fortunate with our partners. I mean, you talked about one dropping in and out. You know, we just had one who, who unfortunately had to go, but the others were fantastic. And we're talking, you know, English is a second language, different time zones, so they're accommodating with, with everything like that. So, you know, we're really quite lucky. Fantastic. So join me in thanking Rowan, Gianni and Melinda for their fantastic insight into their pivot. Thanks, guys. Um, let me find on my running sheet where I'm up to. I need to cross out where I'm at. Here we go. Okay. Uh, da, 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 da. Okay, so now we're going to, a key objective and assumption of this project was to be able to help companies <laughs> enter new export markets. So we're going to specifically look at that. So Colin Wood, he's going to today our next conversation. Colin is the founder and CEO of Verso Learning, which is now used by teachers in over 100 countries to collect student voice and support the implementation of evidence-based high-impact learning teaching strategies in the classroom. Thanks very much, Colin. Thanks, David. <coughs> um, I just want to start by probably like some of you came here with some quite specific thoughts and certainly a run sheet that I was um, thinking to, to go through. But we are very much a business in reflection. And I think, David, congratulations on what a great day because each session has enabled me to reflect a bit more on, on this process, You know, it, especially the last one uh, on pivoting, the one before that on, on that sort of marketing and, and, um, and then the research this morning. So. That's been absolutely fantastic, and I hope it's been the same for, for the rest of you. So um, we've got Sarah from Kahoot and Sharanya from Cadmus. Uh, I'll let them do a, a, a quick intro of themselves. Uh, but we're certainly sort of here for the next 30 minutes to talk about uh, exporting EdTech. Hello, um, I'm Sarah from Kahoot Learning. We are Kahoot Learning with the C, and we do workplace training. We often get a bit mixed up with Kahoot with the K. Um, so we work with adults, and in particular, adults within organisations. So if you ever have the um, the notification pop up saying you got HR training in next week, and kind of get that <sighs> feeling, we we try to not do that. <laughs> we try to make it. Uh, far more entertaining and all about social learning as well. So we want to connect adults and remind how joyous learning can be through our digital program. Awesome. Um, I'm Sharanya from Cadmus. Um, we're an assessment platform and we work with uh, universities, so the higher ed space. Um, and I guess with Cadmus, what we're really trying to do is sort of take a lot of these teaching and learning principles that exist out there in research and sort of embed them in our platform and technology, just making it easier for, you know, academics, researchers who, you know, may not be trained teachers but in many cases are forced to teach, um, making it easier for them to create, I guess, assessments that really enable and facilitate learning so students around, you know, at the other end are actually getting the most out of each assessment experience. Excellent, and a bit, bit of background on, on Verso. Um, we had a hypothesis at the, the start of this project, which we wanted to really exploit the, the research component for, and it was to see the extent to which student voice could be a more powerful driver for improving teacher impact than perhaps policy or, or process or, or other things, so really using that voice in the classroom. Um, so we had six schools that we worked with, um, and the folks at Monash. Uh, which was great. Um, we had one in New Zealand and 
one in uh, one in the UK and four here in, in Victoria. So, and that was all um, high schools. Um, so, just before we get into some of the nitty gritty of the the questions, um, Sarah, what role did you play in the project um, at Kahoot with a C? So, our founder Anthony Morris actually led this project. I'm stepping in for him today. Um, and but usually, I'm the one of the leading designers. Um, I'm also the platform steward of the Kahoot platform. Um, it was interesting because usually we do work really closely together designing courses, however this one is entirely in Spanish and none of us speak Spanish. So it was, it was you know, a bit of a peripheral uh, involvement but we, we all kind of learnt together throughout the project with Anawak. Was the data in Spanish? <laughs> yes, <laughs> I think everything was. <laughs> Um, so within the project, so my role at Cadmus is um, as a product manager, so, and I guess sort of, you know, with many small businesses, I wear a fair few hats, so um, within the project, I was sort of, you know, working with the Edugrowth team. We have a team of learning designers and learning support staff that are actually out there working with the academics using the platform, so just sort of coordinating on that side and um, doing a bit of the data analysis, all that sort of stuff. Excellent. And, and my role, probably similar to Dom, still here. Um, as a founder of Verso, um, I've been sort of in the space for 20 odd years, initially over in the UK, um, before Asia and, and out here to, to Australia. But exporting is expensive. And I think as a business owner, you really want to get your head around that. And so I love this opportunity to, um, to really get the efficacy of what we're doing in the market that we're doing it in. And for me, I've always been pretty hands on. And I think, you know, um, played a, a pretty major role in this project. But then uh, we, we lost a member of staff fairly early on and, and, and became the role in the project. So, uh, no, and, and loved every minute of it. So that was my role. Um, so when deploying to an international market, and obviously we, we all had a, an international component to this project, how do you go about finding the market and then choosing the client in the market? Was it sort of fairly organic? Or tell us a bit about how that worked. Uh, well, we were deployed to Mexico, and I'm bitterly disappointed we weren't deployed in person. Um, but, you know, being an online provider, that's just the way we have to roll. Um, I actually don't know how we got the, the relationship with Anamak. I'm assuming it's through, through this uh, partnership with uh, Global Fic. And, um, yeah, I can't answer that one because I'm not Anthony. So I'm just okay. going to say. No problem. Well, maybe Sharanya. I know um, you've got a bit of a story there. Yeah, I mean, I think for us, um, the higher ed market in Australia is limited in terms of universities. So for a long time, we've sort of been trying to figure out what the next step is. So, you know, your traditional market segmentation. So, you know, we've been looking at the US, Canada, UK, sort of markets where there's sort of a bit of similarity between how the universities are structured, how learning works, all that sort of stuff. Um, and I guess, you know, we're quite fortunate here in Australia in terms of teaching and learning practices. We've found that there is a lot of innovation going on here and a lot of these other um, geographies are quite keen to follow a lot of the practices that are happening. So the, the UK stood out as one example there and, you know, again, with the size of the market, there was a heap of opportunity. In terms of, I guess, selecting our specific partners, um, we chose to lean on the networks that, uh, you know, universities we'd been working with here had um, themselves, so you know, through you know, research partnerships that the universities already have. So in this case, we worked with the University of Melbourne and had been working with them, you know, for over the last five years, and tapped into their network. So the University of Manchester came on as our new partner there. Um, and again, it just makes sense and makes the process a bit easier because you've got sort of these warm introductions, you've got references, you've got the success stories from you know, sort of like for like universities that you can actually take over there, and then it sort of eases or de-risks some of. Um, um, the hesitations a new university might have. Yeah, excellent. And I know certainly, I mean, as a business, we are probably 75% um, international in terms of our client base and revenue base, and, and that would be reflected in our sales pipeline as well. So we seem to be continuing to, to go in the export. Um, we probably tried for three markets. Um, most of our business is in the US. Um, but funnily enough, um, we came up against some data sovereignty issues with uh, the US partner schools that we wanted to work with and whether their data would be 
uh, okay being analysed by an Australian institution. Normally everyone's the other way around and no one wants the US to get hold of it. But um, yeah, so that was, that was quite interesting and that sort of came through as a bit of a, an 11th hour. Um, we were also very keen to get back into the UK, a market that I hadn't personally worked in or, or the business hadn't worked in for, for many years. Um, and I think Rowan made the point that the relationship piece is, is so critical. And so for us, we had some schools that I'd worked with in a previous life and having that relationship uh, was probably instrumental in not finding the right market because we knew we, want, you know, we had a pretty good plan to go to the UK, but finding the right school in the UK we knew that we needed a principal that we knew that we had some experience with um, and that, that helped enormously. And I think was evident in the fact that, again, like the, the previous panel, um, we had another school in New Zealand uh, that, that, that left as quick as they joined. Um, so they, they sort of came in, I think, from memory. We submitted our application on a Monday. Um, these guys came in. Um, on the Monday, um, and in fact, New Zealand was probably not an, ac an accident because they were the only time zone that was ahead of us. Um, everyone else was still on the weekend. So um, we were really hoping to pull New Zealand in. Ironically, they now want to work with us. We, you know, through circumstance, uh, or unfortunate unfor circumstance, we didn't get much out of them in the, in the time. But, but I think that relationship piece was critical. You know, the country, strategic, but the, the partner, um, the relationship really, really played a part there. So. Excellent. Um, so once we've got into these markets and we're running um, at a rate of knots, as we've also talked about today, this concept of sprinting rather than the marathon, um, how, how did you go with the concept of product market fit? Was that straight out of the box? Was that a piece of work in itself? Did the research inform that? Tell us a bit about that. So we have our own uh, learning platform designed for social learning with adults and we thought, well, we'll see if that works somewhere else. So, you know, into the Latin market, uh, Latin American market uh, with our platform as is, uh, but completely translated. And I actually wrote here, it, we enjoyed the challenge of the translation. That, that's quite the exaggeration. It was challenging. And, you know, it, particularly it was a, a course that we presented called Adaptive Leadership that we know back to front, like we know how to do it, we know what works. And to then completely translate it and deliver it to you know, not only in another language but a completely other uh, culture fit was was really um, it was interesting it was a, it was a good learning curve for us um, what we did find was they they loved the social learning aspect and that that gave us a lot of joy as well so um, that it worked really really well which is great but interesting Steph mentioned in one of the other panels uh, one of their learnings was about email and that's exactly what we kind of fell into you know in Australian workforces we're kind of used to a lot of our communication just being email based and that's not the case in Latin America and that was a big assumption that we just walked straight into um, and that was you know us probably not researching the learner as much as what we should have and researching the cultural so um, as part of my role as the product steward um, for, for Kahoot platform, we're now integrating WhatsApp into the platform so we can have that other communication method which is going to hit a, a different cultural fit. The other thing we have to do is learn how to do workplace emails in WhatsApp. <laughs> you know, here, uh, uh, you know, culturally in Australia, we probably would be quite annoyed if our work started WhatsApping us all the time. So, you know, it's it's all that that sort of learning, and it's all about understanding the learner, understanding how they communicate, because you, it, it was it was a bit of a challenge just getting them onto the platform because they weren't reading email, and you know, they're a bit far away to go knock on the door. As I said, would have loved to next time. Hint, hint. You know, send us over, but. Um, for now, it was we were a bit hands tied with that. Yeah. No, that's interesting. And Shania? Um, I think you know we, for simplicity, again chose to work with an English speaking country. We weren't quite ready for the translation challenges yet. But even then, you know, you notice all these small differences in language. You know, 
courses are different to courses here and modules and you know all these small changes that you know we were also learning through the process as well so and yeah i think as we start to expand our adoption there we can look at things like localization within the platform and you know all these language differences that you know at the end of the day for an individual user coming through it's just you know less of a change they need to be making in their minds it just makes that process a little bit easier but yeah it was a little bit easier on our end yeah, it's, it's interesting because we, again, English speaking, so removed a heap of the, certainly the communication barriers. But I think for us, it was more, you know, being in the sort of education policy and, and you know, whilst we are in the business for learner impact, our learners don't have an impact or there's no impact on our learners if we don't get into our teachers and if our teachers don't get into it unless the schools adopt it. And of course, through all of that has to be a why. So that was probably the biggest learning for us was why were the teachers in the UK going to pick up our product and start using it? Now, we knew there was an inherent value there and student voice is a pretty global um, concept. But again, teachers have got a thousand things to do and they're all in a list of priorities, often dictated by the principal, if not the system. And so we had to really understand what were the drivers that were going to get teachers to use our product? What was really nice, um, and Joe that we worked with at Monash, the data was exactly the same because sure enough, kids reflect on their learning very similarly wherever they are in the world and I'm, I'm sure it would be the case in what other, whatever language. So analysing the data and, the, and, and I guess that UK data set with the Australian data set, um, given that they were using the same form with the same questions, there was a lot of consistency there, but certainly for us, the marketing was in the why, you know, and it was a semantics. It was it was little things, but but without getting them right, um, and I'm sure distance played a part, but we had to work that little bit harder to get the same usage over there as we had here in uh, in Victoria. Um, now the program itself, and again we talked about um, what David certainly championed the benefits of sprint versus marathon. Uh, in terms of the cycles. How do you think the program really supported and assisted in that export initiative, certainly in, in your case, Sarah, to, um, to Mexico? I think the partnerships were key, like the relationship buildings and you know the warm introductions and, and just the regular meetings um, and support that we had along the way was critical. Um, we at Kahoot are not used to it, but we don't mind a sprint. Like we, we like we like a good pivot and a good sprint keeps us fresh and keeps things interesting. Um, but having a really strong support system the entire way was was a great success and enabled us to continue um, to build strong relationships within Latin America. Not only with Anawak, who we started this this project with, but with other universities and now with BHP, we're doing a, a course in Chilean for for them at the moment. So. Um, it, none of that would have been possible without the support of this project and the structure, really. Excellent. And um, and is, is that so? The, I've got a note here: the e-commerce rolling out. Is that the um, that's in Chile? Is it the or BHP? The, yes. Yes. Oh, yep. Cool. Yep. Don't Ex ask me to. No, no, that's in Chile. all right. Thank we'll, you. we'll go back to Anthony <laughs> at another time for that one. And Shranya. Um, yeah, I mean, I think for us, we've been really fortunate enough through the program, through the program to have, um, in particular with the University of Manchester, seen a lot of success. So they were, you know, a new university that came on for us. And I guess with the program, it was, you know, both through the funding, the sort of credibility of, you know, the different bodies involved, the researchers involved. It gave the university sort of more confidence and sort of a low risk way of trialling the product, you know, and otherwise, if it weren't sort of for the hard and fast deadlines of, you know, everyone needs to come on board by this date to be part, you know, participate, these processes take so long. Um, you know, you can sort of be going through the motions for months and months, but, you know, this gave us, yeah, a clear time for university to jump on board. They felt, you know, confidence in the, 
I guess the level of like rigor that was coming through in the evaluation and in the efficacy, um, and that in this case has been enough for um, the university to now say, yeah, um, you know, we've seen the value in this in this short time frame. Let's roll this out further um, across the university. So yeah, that's worked out really well for us. And I think also even for the um, local universities, so the Victorian universities, it was great that we were able to involve you know one of those partners as well because. I guess for us, it's just another benefit or value that we can add to our partners here, you know, saying that, you know, you can come on board and be part of these really cool research projects and they can also get added value out of, you know, the platform that they've been using for years and, you know, test out new things. So, yeah, regardless of if they were new or existing, we saw a heap of value for our partners. And I think you've seen that here with Melbourne Uni, is that right? Yeah, yeah. exactly right. Excellent. Yeah. I guess for us, the, the program, and I, I think come back to David's point about the benefits of a sprint over a, over a marathon. Um, we've always sort of taken an efficacy-based approach and we've, you know, been talking for years with the folks at the University of Newcastle and Jenny Gore and University of Melbourne and John Hattie, um, but never have we learnt as much as our sprint with Monash because it was, you know, I mean, we were meeting what seemed like every two weeks. Um, you know, and, and there was a hustle about it. You know, it was kind of, we need this data. Oh, shit, OK, yep. Um, all right, well, let's build a survey. Let's collect that data. And, and, and again, these, you know, so again, it's probably, to use Rebecca's point, it, it probably wasn't that research with a capital R. But I reckon we've got some instruments and methodologies in place now that will go on to inform. Um, and, and the program as a whole, I mean, we've now got John Hattie writing a paper with Joe from Monash. Um, which, again, isn't going to happen in a few weeks, but is now being put together. And, and I don't think that would have, you know, John always talked about it, but now being with Joe, and I think they had a previous, Joe was at Melbourne, and, and so it, 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 you know, it's those sort of incidentals that have come out of this project that I think, again, when you put efficacy at the heart of what you do, um, and I think for me, it was also that translation of now, efficacy is probably in charge of our marketing department. And I think that was talked about earlier, that, you know, again, you've got to be able to get that across. And of course, when you go to the UK or New Zealand, impact and efficacy is a global language. Um, you know, the education state policies may not be. So I think that was, that was definitely a, 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 a great learning experience for us. So we've talked about, I guess, how the program assisted um, with, with that particular export. More broadly, how do you, you think the program, or this type of program, um, what value do you think it adds to EdTech's international expansion and the like? Well, for us, it was just this wonderful opportunity to test what we think makes good adult learning somewhere completely different. Like, that we couldn't pass that up. Um, there's a real joy in being, a, you know, Victorian-based tiny business, and, and speaking for myself, I'm, I'm regional Victoria. I'm in one of the smallest towns in the middle of, you know, middle of northeast Victoria, and to be working with uh, some wonderful people in universities, and you know, being involved in something big and and meaningful is just it's it was it was fantastic. Um, not only that, just the the pride, I guess, in realizing that other people do like what we do. It's not, you know, it's it was the learners who completed the course, embraced it. We now have uh, Anawak is now building their advanced diploma of e-commerce with us now, um, which will be delivered again in Spanish. Um, but you know, we trust them that to, that to help will help them do that. Um, and then the results that we got out of the, the courses that we run were, were results we'd never seen before with Australian um, audiences, I guess, or Australian learners. We had a, a net, prom net promoter score of 93 and 94. And to kind of put that in perspective, you know, Harvard Business School goes for 80, so we're like, yeah, better than Harvard. You know, that's, we'll, we'll take that. But, you know, it's, it's just those sort of little value points that, that made it. Yeah, you know, it's just kind of, it's nice. And it was really, it's just, even if we'd fallen on our face, we still would have enjoyed it. We would have got some really great learning out of and made a better product from that. Um, the other great value, or the other valuable outcome we had was the, um, the Education Alliance Finland report, which, which, we, uh, which we got, and we, we, you know, 95 out of 100, which again, small Victorian based 
digital learning company. We're just so bustlingly proud of that. And we couldn't have done any of this without this program. So it's, we just like being involved and learning and spreading the joy of le learning. So, um, you know, let's bring learning to the world. It's a small Australian business. Why not export? If we can get these opportunities, go for it. Excellent. Thanks, Erin. Australia? Yeah, I mean, I think for us, and probably similar to how it sounds like Verso was as well, we, you know, always understood the importance of research. We work with universities, the academics on our platform, all doing research themselves. It makes sense to be communicating with them in the same way. But we just hadn't really cracked the nut on how to do that consistently, ongoing. You know, we it's sort of trialled different evaluation processes, and in our pilots, we were always, you know, reporting back on what had gone on. But I think the real value for us in this was just sort of the clarity it provided us around, you know, honing in on a few key objectives or outcomes that you really wanted to work towards. Um, and like improving the rigor, I guess, of that um, data collection process as well. You know, it's, it is, um, does make it a bit more challenging, you know, if it's easy to report on the data that you're collecting through your own platform, but marrying that up with, you know, what's going on at the university and, you know, historic data, all that sort of stuff. Um, it does improve the way that you are communicating back and, you know, um, that idea of marketing as well. You know, we've in the last couple of weeks gone through this process of even just looking at our, all of our value props that, you know, we talk about with new customers, existing customers, and just for each of them, you know, what's the evidence that we actually have to show this? And, you know, where we don't have it, what can we go out and get now? And, yeah, I think for us that's what it's really been. And I think... Sort of this program and this first step of doing the efficacy reports was good, but I think what we'd love to see would be sort of taking this to the next level. So, again, being in higher ed, we do want to do that research with a capital R because, you know, the weight that that holds, you know, especially when you're going to international markets, of being like, hey, you know, we have actually published this and there's all this, um, you know, rigour and um, evidence that's gone into this um, carries a lot of weight. And I think the other sort of thing in there that we want to continue doing is sort of doing this in sort of different, whether that's different export markets, different use cases, different disciplines. So you've got actually this whole range of evidence banked across every sort of way that people want to be using the platform and every location, every sort of year level. So yeah, I think it's been a step in the right direction for us and given us a heap of value. We just want to see it taken to the next level. No, excellent. And I, I mean, I think the program, um, I think it's quite unique. I don't know that there's many others elsewhere in the world to bring these sort of key stakeholders together. Um, for me, having been through it now, and, and I guess having been in the space for 20 odd years and, and always thought I had this efficacy focus, it almost feels like a rite of passage that we should be offering to any legitimate startup. But if you are starting a business in education, I mean, surely it's good for the economy, for society, for our future, that, hey, what if they worked really well and had a massive impact? I mean, if they had an impact and we just funded the discovery of that impact and possibly even the pivoting and the refining and the iterations of that, then we're going to be in a much better place. And, you know, there's a heap of technology out there and they all do great things. But if we help those companies really tune in on what it is they do really well, I don't think anyone loses. And I think in a world where, and this is something we've learned a lot from our international schools over the last, I'd say, three months overseas, given the start of their academic year in the Northern Hemisphere, but certainly since January here, this teacher shortage is going to kill us. And in the US, I think the latest report I read, there are a million down. There are a million teachers short. Now, I'm sure I see other industries innovate when you've got issues like that. And I think the ed tech companies are who we should turn to for that innovation. And I think if we can help surface that, then I think we're going to innovate our way out of this a lot quicker. And certainly the US are going to find a million teachers hanging around doing not a lot that they never knew they had. So I think for me, this type of program, to re replicate that nationally, um, I think the one thing that is missing, um, that I'd really like, I think, Global Vic to probably um, reach across the road, is get more Department of Education people in here.
because I think we've got the innovation in the room. We're measuring the efficacy. I mean, we're doing most of the hard work for them, right? I mean, it's... <laughs> so I think, I think that's probably the one thing I, I would add. But I think surely, if, we've, if, we, if we're sitting in front of what might be a pretty horrific education crisis due to you know, teacher burnout and, and teacher numbers, I think probably the ed techs um, and programs like this are going to be part of the saviour. So I think that will be, that'll be my closing remark. Um, I think that's all the questions we've got on here. Um, I'm not sure where in the room people look to tell they've got three minutes. Maybe it was on a phone or a watch, which I don't wear. Oh, down there. There we go. Um, I'm left-handed, so my world's always this side. Um, so we've got three minutes and 33 seconds left um, for questions. Um, probably the question is, outside of this project or even thinking bigger around export, how are you deciding upon what markets to approach? What would be your three criteria? Question. Sarah, you want to? Yeah, take it away. No, I was, I was, you want to have a think? Shrania? Um, I think for us it's sort of, you know, how much work is needed to actually like, does a platform fit? Do we have sort of a proven product market fit? So, you know, for us, it's the English-speaking countries, universities that have a similar model to us, size of the markets in there as well. Um, what's another top factor? And I think the other top thing for us at the moment is do we have sort of warm inroads to these places as well? So, again, that idea of, like, can we lean on partners that we've worked with here and work through their networks as opposed to us, you know, just landing in a country cold and just knocking on doors at universities? So, yeah, those are sort of the top three things for us at the moment. I, I think for us, the, the term here is partnership. Um, we, we, love, we love to work with people who will meet us and, and work with us to develop um, great adult learning. One of the challenges we face is work workplace training, uh, particularly online workplace training, is the prevalence of uh, e-learning. Um, so we are, we are a social digital platform for learning and that is very different to sitting in front of your, your screen just going through the tick box on your own and learning on your own. So having a partner that is willing to say we will work with you on, on breaking those assumptions with our adult learners, that, that's a huge, that, that gets us 10 steps in already um, to, to developing a really awesome uh, adult learning course. So a, a partnership, a willing to come with us on the journey and somebody um, to find them, just, I don't know, we, we'll, we'll work with anyone. We, you know, give us the language, we'll translate, we'll, um, you know, just, just be willing to work with us and, and go on the journey. And particularly, you know, with working with SMEs, um, we will love your content as much as you do, but just let us change it to suit a busy adult learner. Um, let us meet them where they are. So I guess it's, it's a little bit nebulous. It's not, we can't have a criteria, unfortunately, but we, we, know, we know a good partner when we, when we find them. So, you know, we'll continue work with them. I think I would, um, my first business out of the UK, we got some venture funding back in 2003 and it was quite early for venture capital to be involved in EdTech and they just went, China, We've got to go to China, there's more people in China than you know, anywhere else in the world. And then you go to China and you realise this is going to be really hard, especially in 2003. They had other priorities. Um, a really funny story is I met someone in the bathroom at a university of Cardiff who was the general manager of the University of Southern Queensland and that's why I'm sitting here right now. Um, because there was a, a, a common language, a conversation. We talked about, hey, yeah, we've got the same problems. I didn't come and see you because you were so far away. Six months later, we had a five-year contract with the University of Southern Queensland, and we got here. And now trying to convince our venture capital company that Australia was the future. It was too small, it was too far away, but you know what? We grew more real business here quicker because there was a relationship forming and there was a, a bit more common ground. Time's up. <laughs> um, perfect. Thanks very much to Colin, Sharana, and Sarah for giving us a bit of an idea about exporting ed tech markets. So we've made an executive decision. We're going to shorten our break. So why don't we just, if you need to, go to the bathroom, grab a cup of tea, 
grab a, a glass of water. I'm a, a, a told that there will be alcohol coming, so if you're feeling a bit, oh, I'm not sure, I don't know if I really want to hear David Linky speak more, but you've got at least Margaret Beerman and Hurt Callas who can um, give you some energy and, and excite you. So we're going to move really into our final conversation around the EdTech Innovation Alliance, which is really around this idea of this triple helix model. Can I just, you want to maybe push the slides forward a little bit? And uh, I'll begin by um, asking Herc and Margaret to give us an introduction. Herc, you want to just tell us who you are? Because I can't find it on my sheet while I'm looking here. Uh, of course. Uh, you don't have to read your own bio. You probably <laughs> wrote it. You probably go off the cuff. Uh, yeah. So my name's Herc Kalis. I'm the uh, founder and CEO of Cadmus. We're an assessment for learning company, which meant to help people learn through assessment. Um, and we've been around for about five, six, seven years and uh, really grateful to be part of this initial program here. Margaret Beerman, you've already heard a lot from me. I'm from the Centre for Research and Assessment in Digital Learning, um, Cradle at Deakin University and I've been one of the academic leaders of the research part of this. And you're selling yourself short there. You were certainly made an incredible contribution to the idea of the concepts there. And we've been talking about this idea of a triple helix model of innovation. And it's a, a well-known model, right? There are three actors in the model, government, industry, and researchers. And we're going to add a fourth one. So we're going to go with um, triple helix plus, because we're going to add educators in there as well. And we've heard throughout the whole day about this idea of this triple helix model of connecting these people. Um, so I want to go to you, Herc, to begin with. What sort of value did the Global Victoria Tech Innovation Alliance bring to your project and whether or not this triple helix added the value that you expected? Or is it something that's a byproduct of the process? Yeah, it, I think this is a unique prog program, really. Uh We've done a lot of government grant stuff, and this is one of the pieces that I think help to align us more closely to universities. And we say that having originally as a company spun out of a research partnership with a university, so we have a little bit of background in uh, research and, and what that's like to do in a university. But the funding from the government, I think, was just a huge component to this because it allowed us to engage with universities in a way in which the commercials or at least the initial part of it was taken care of and that gives you the ability to change the model with which you engage with an institution it's no longer this is what it costs per seat or this is what you'll have to commit to the government funding actually gives you the freedom to go to an institution and say um, hey we can do some research and we can do some proof of concept testing together and you know all you have to do is provide the the students and the teachers to to get involved so that's a really crucial component and it's an easier sell for our partners who wanted to bring other partners in. So we went to University of Melbourne and they said, well, we'd love to bring Manchester in, but we don't want to ask them for any money. And so the ability to make that happen uh, was... Well, can I just thought, well, what's wrong with, the, with these universities? Ask for money. Money is what drives this process. We're all scared of asking for money. Sorry, second it, pipe. But I just had this conversation with someone, so I wanted to highlight it as well. I've heard it again in three minutes. Ask for money. Universities hate asking other people for money. Um, not government, but they hate asking other universities <laughs> <laughs> to contribute money, so they feel like it's more altruistic if, if they don't, which, which I agree and don't agree with but the the other thing the second component was the research a bit and I think this is the bit that we've touched um, maybe just the the tip of the iceberg on the ability to engage researchers meaningfully into this process and and yeah I think that's the bit in which we can really build upon in this in this part uh, well, those who've been here all day know that I'm taking over for Luke and the notes you say Luke refers to notes so I'm not sure what I was supposed to refer to. So um, I'll, I'll push forward and can I'll I get Margaret. Can, um, I, can yeah. I jump in just yeah, on those yeah. points? See, seeing as yeah. you, you're referring to it, Luke's, Luke's notes, Luke's I'm going gonna, 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 to improvise off them. So um, what I think is really interesting is I think that the government funding isn't just about funding. I think it's also about an imprimatur of saying you've gone through a okay. process and you are actually judged to be successful. And I suspect that if you actually had that imprimatur, you could actually go ask a university for some funding. But it's something about not turning up cold and saying, 
I've got a great idea, give me some money, but saying I've got an idea that has some, someone has endorsed us to do this thing. So that, that's what I wanted to add. I think that's a really important point, Margaret. I, I genuinely think, and I talked about it this morning about Brand Halo, there is this expectation that when there's a government process involved in it, whether, whether we think it's a rigorous one or not, that's a completely different conversation. There is, that does bring rigour to it, but there is a really important component of government bringing that along. And especially around, if you think about the way that most education in Australia is funded, which is public funding, um, there adds that value as well. So I absolutely 100% agree. Can I go back to the model for a moment of this triple helix and ask you from a researcher's perspective, what are you looking to contribute into that model? Like, are you thinking about what, what is the outcome that you're trying to achieve in it? I think one of the reasons this was so successful is actually we didn't strongly put that into the mix this time. What we really saw, and I heard this again and again throughout, throughout this today, is that everyone was after the same thing impact, success of these products, impact on learners, making it better. So we weren't thinking about, for us, I mean, we've got a publication underway, but this very strongly for us was about that kind of a contribution, which meant we weren't running so strongly on some of those other agendas that, that, that we run. I mean, I'm not up here, sometimes when I do these sorts of talks, or if, certainly if Phil does these sorts of talks, he'll be up here saying, and here's my book, and here's my, um, and here's a paper that I wrote, and why don't you look it up? And we're not in that mode here. We, we've actually come in support of the industry because, and this is a really, I think, a significant piece for us, is because we think that this is what the benefit for this product will be. And out of that, we're gaining something else, and don't get me wrong, there's plenty of gains, but it's not the traditional academic gains that people go into this space with. And I think that's made a huge difference. I think it's also maybe, again, a question without notice to think about is, the government of the day that we respond to, which is the, the new federal government, the Labor government, have these you know, big targets of industry connection. Yeah. And I wonder what that might mean from your perspective and whether you see that as part of this program. Does that tick a box? Yeah, it does. But I think for, for us, and to sort of very kind of, um, feels like abstractly answer it, I think the process is a point of connection. Yep. So how we're doing what we're doing, and you and I have had this conversation before about that this, the model is what we're getting out of this rather than, than, than anything else. And so it actually perfectly fits into that. Because to me, it is about how, how universities can better connect with industry, not just in this space, but, but all over. Um, and I think that one of the great things about this has been able for everyone to, to, to lean in a little bit to everyone else's agendas. It's that leap of faith we talked about Indeed. four or five hours ago. And in fact, Phil and I talked about this, about this idea. Maybe, maybe we need to create an industry academic work masterclass of how you connect and what the interconnection points might be. But that's a project beyond the scope of this. I want to come back to the uh, agenda here for a moment, Herc, and I want to get your perspective. You, you're an entrepreneur, but you started in the university, right? Did I get that correct? So you, you sit on both sides of this fence, or are you now full, have you picked one? <laughs> I, uh, yeah, I, I engaged with the universities with a clear idea of working on a problem that would solve something much larger. And so the, the engagement with the university on my side was, quite targeted from a research perspective, that I wanted some rigour in this. Perfect. So now, come to this. Uh, give, give us an insight into your experience in engaging university entities. Because I, I want to break down the university in a second as well, because we talk about university engagement, and we may need to be a little bit more explicit. But I want to talk to you a little bit about research and, in, and university, maybe up and down that spectrum, and what, what, what this actually means. How do you engage? What, what are they looking for? What are you looking for? With a university specifically, it, it's a... <coughs> There's a spectrum, and I think Margaret really touched on this point, where researchers often want to do research for, for their own benefit, and they've got questions they want to answer. And often those questions are not associated with anything that's directly going to lead to a financial return for a company who, who has to do that for its survival. And um, the process and the rigour that researchers put into this program, I think, provided the benefit from a researcher side more so than writing a paper or a publication, so I totally agree with that. 
in engagement with researchers, though, that is often the problem in an institution, that the alignment's not there and you're being asked for money. So, um, yeah, we, we've been on ARC things where the government, will be, you'll have to contribute for a researcher's pay and, and often the questions are not amazingly aligned up to what you're trying to achieve. So that's a researcher piece. I, the institution one, there's a lot of levels there. Um, it depends who you want to dive in. Just as a side note, we've been here all day. Is this the most vacuumed carpet in Melbourne? That vacuum cleaner has gone for five hours today. The most vacuumed carpet in Melbourne. All right, sorry, just a complete side note. Um, coming back to you for a second, Margaret, let's think about researcher perspective. What, what are the barriers that you perceived before you went into it in connecting with EdTech companies and what actually helped? The vacuum again, right? <laughs> um, so, actually, and I, I did want to follow through, actually, I, having said all that, that, that I think some, some of the partnerships have organically resulted in that more research paper sort of research, and they found the alignments. And I think that's been really fabulous, because that's the best way to go about it. Now, you have to ask me the question again, because I've already forgotten. I'm it was about the, the barriers. You're listening to the... It might actually be a mixer for drinks, actually, yeah. as I think about it. Um, it's, well, that's um, all right, then. The question was the barriers are, are connecting with ed tech companies that you perceived up front, and then what maybe turned out to be true or not true. Um, I, I think that... Um, I think that th there was some... What's the word? Imaginary barriers. Like I hadn't thought about them too hard. Okay, yep. so I just want to say this without saying this isn't a belief I've stuck to very firmly. But you sort of have this idea that a company's really just going to be focused on its bottom line. Like that's the thing that's going to really matter to it. And what I think I found, and I think we all shared in, it's the team shared in, was just, just this sense of how much everyone was invested in making things better for learners, for education generally. So I think that was a really sort of um, key sort of a nebulous perhaps prejudice that was really sort of reduced during the time. That's probably true of many interactions across society, right? You perceive mm -hmm. things before they're there and they may not actually, may not actually be there. And I'll, I'll share for those entrepreneurs in the room and those online that I had a conversation with a researcher at one of our partners in the last, I don't know, six months, in which it was really clear to us that the issues that they faced are very similar to the issues that EdTech entrepreneurs face, or any entrepreneur really is. Funding, how do you get the initial funding to establish a lab? How do you keep employing people? How do you keep producing outputs? There's a slightly different mechanism of getting there. But there are lots of, there's a lot more that is in common that is not in common or whatever the alternative I'm looking for there. So I think we, we sort of get an understanding that there's a lot of commonality between these two groups. I want to move a little bit into the actual testbed activation process and what we may have learnt in that process. So through your experience at Cadmus, um, Herc, of the EdTech Innovation Alliance, what was the value gained for you as an organisation? Um, yeah, for us, we're a little bit more established, I suppose, having been through a number of institutions in, in the past. And the value is really optimising some of the things we're doing. I think one of the, the big things that we got some validation on, because we've tested and tried a lot of things, it's, it's going back to the things and figuring out what works. But maybe just doing more stuff pre uh, in from in from a collection process and having a, a research partner on board that that was able to say hey no we need this as part of the project then allows you to push that back onto the to the new institution and say hey we need this as part of this this sort of process and so that allows you to collect some pre and post data that helps you get efficacy out but ultimately just the ability to embed the the software in a in a new place and and have that run produces data and evidence, which then you can turn around and, and make a case for in that institution. And um, we were lucky enough that that went really well. Uh, and so that institution's gone from five subjects to the whole institution using the platform. So yeah, those small trials and small test beds, uh, especially in institutions, are sort of crucial to be able to then drive huge adoption. I'm going to ask you a question about your education partners in a second, but I, I'm going to pose the same question to you, Marg, which is, but flip it from the other side. What was the value that you saw, say, for Deacon and Monash as the lead researchers, from your perspective in the in the test bed, in the process? So I think um, 
the big thing for us was seeing this model roll out and to actually have a sense on how these relationships might continue and also to have a sense of what works. I mean, we, we are running a research project alongside this that will, in a more sort of rigorous way, unpack some of the, the, the ideas underpinning this. But it just... Um, it, it was just... It's just really interesting to reflect on everything that people are saying and have this sort of this idea of what can happen in these within these very simple parameters and for 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 us I think to observe what happens when you just lay these very simple ideas in international partner interested ed tech company um, research mentor some templates some ideas mix it all together and see what happens, I think that was, that's of immense interest because it's actually not a lot of investment to get quite a lot of really meaningful interaction. I agree with the, with the, the cheapness of the program, to be honest. In, in terms of government-funded programs, it's not, it wasn't an incredible amount of money to deliver some of the outcomes and it was designed as a pilot to see what it looks like and what it may do into the future. And there has been a question online which I'll, I'll answer which is, is there going to be a second inter iteration of the EdTech Innovation Alliance? The answer, the answer is, we hope so. Right? I haven't got an agreement on that. We, we are talking about it. There's conversations happening at the federal government level in partnership with state governments and all sorts of things, but there's no announcement that I can make today that says, yep, on you know, X day we're going to open applications. So I'll keep getting that question. I've given you a bit of time to think, a um, bit of thinking time there, Herc, about what value have you seen in working with your education partners? Has it been an iterative process? Have things changed as you've gone along? Have you co-designed with them? Have you solved problems that you may not have thought about? Yeah, I, just to touch on, on the last point as well, Australian companies, I think, disproportionately do a lot with very little from an investment I agree perspective. 100%. Um, you know, we're, we're all smell of an oily rag and, and figure out how to really strings and beeswax things together. And, um, you know, even this modest amount of money we can all make sort of work. It does take tremendous investment to do it on our part and, and on every partner's part here. But I think we, we have sort of, as Australians, got this ability to do a lot with very, very little. And, and that's what I think we've managed to prove here in this, this perspective. Um, in terms of the current question you asked, uh, David, can you just... Uh, the question <laughs> was... That it, one again? It, it, it's in broad terms. The question was, did you actually co-design with your education partners a solution to maybe even something they didn't know they were trying to solve, right? Yeah. Or even that you could solve? Yeah, I, and, and we're always doing that as a as a way to generate more benefit and value. I think as 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 iterative entities, which which ed techs are, which universities are, which researchers are, it's consistently trying to find where the the benefit or the value might be. So, Gab Finn from Manchester, who who Margaret met in Lyon earlier this year. Um, she was our project lead, essentially, at, at University of Manchester, Vice Dean of Students for BMH, Biology, Medicine, Health. Um, everyone has their own acronyms. Um, we were talking about awarding gaps today. So what can we do to see if the impact of the tool in helping students who are from disadvantaged backgrounds uh, not be disadvantaged in marking processes and not be disadvantaged through assessment tasks and topics of diversity and inclusion. So that then goes back into the product, that then gets fed back into the data we analyse and look at, and then that gets put eventually out into features that we do. So for us, the whole thing is co-design because uh, we can't do anything without students, teachers, institutional stakeholders, researchers, um, because they're the ones that ultimately give feedback on your product. So for us, it's ears to the ground, and, and that's why we invest so heavily, because it's those pieces of information as you're working through a gold nugget. So the closer you can make those iteration points and, in, and iterate them, the, the better off you are. Marg, did you hear through any of the research mentors any stories or anecdotes about the educators' involvement in their projects? Like, would they come regularly to meetings? Were they, was it a separated process? Did they work together? 
Yeah, look, it, it's really, it really, it really varied. I think I don't think it was, it was across the board. And I, I also think that there was a difference between universities and schools as well okay. too. So universities, I think the tertiary sector um, researchers tend, educators tended to be more present. They tended to be a little bit more invested and and have a little bit more. Um, ownership and control over what was in going the on. higher ed space. In the higher ed yeah. space, absolutely. In schools, I got the impression that leadership sort of was often a layer between, but not always. So it, it, it and and I I think the school school sector, and I'm not a schools person. I don't I don't work in schools. I'm waving at Michael, who is who else asked me to keep him awake in this last session. So <laughs> I'll keep you on your toes. Um, is um, I, I, I got the impression that that was a much harder bridge to overcome to get involvement. Um, there were for each um, for each schools-based sort of situation. There are often many teachers involved in a product rather than sort of, for example, Gab Finn. I, I, I mean, to the, the so you know, higher ed works in this way. I'm at this conference in Lyon, completely unrelated. I sit down. I'm having a beer. She says, "Where you're from? Melbourne." Great, I'm from Deakin. She said, oh, do you know Herc? I went, what? <laughs> and, and of course, because that's how higher ed works. We all know each other. In schools, it's a lot more separated. And I think that plays into how the whole school thing works and their input in. But in, in higher ed, I felt there was a lot of input. In some instances, there's a lot of research input. Joe, I can see, you see, we all do know each other. Um, Joe. Joe can speak perhaps to that from the University of Melbourne into um, the Edelex framework. Like there seemed to be a lot of integration there, but um, some of the big schools ones possibly less. I, I would also make the observation that you, yeah, higher ed connects maybe globally, but K to 12 schools collect, connect locally really a lot. There's a lot of interaction between them. They spend a lot of time together and. Uh, I, I use the joke of when you're trying to sell into a new market for education, it's almost like who in the world uses it, who in my country uses it, who in my state, who in my neighbourhood, who in my system, and you just go down the funnel. So I think that that is true of the K-12 school space as well. So let's um, finish our conversation thinking about efficacy. I'm going to give you a really big question here, Marg, which is um, we've talked about efficacy, we defined it with the, the three stages and your PF model and so forth. Now we've seen the reports from EdTech companies. We've seen their sprint report. Have we measured efficacy? What a, what a good question. <laughs> well, I, I think um, we've evaluated efficacy. I think measurement is a very oh, difficult see, now this is word the, this is, here. No, I asked the wrong question, right? That was, I got, um, and I got assessed on the wrong question. Yeah, right. yeah, yeah. So I absolutely think we've evaluated efficacy and I think that that's been really present and at different phases for different sprints. So different sprints have done entirely different things. So some people have really been very much really early on in that process at the sort of the process stage, the stakeholder engagement stage, really critical but the product probably isn't as developed as later for whatever reasons. Other people have been all the way down the track implementing things that are already known. So where those evaluations of efficacy have taken place depend on the sprint. But I would say absolutely everyone has evaluated efficacy in a meaningful way, which is what I would like to sort of propose as a phrasing no, I, I think <laughs> to, to come out component. with. And I think I've shared this story before, certainly with some of the researchers and probably too many times for my own team to care listening to it again. But um, I did have a conversation with Bart Epstein from the University of Virginia a few years ago in a conference. I interviewed him on a stage like this. And we were ask, I was asking about to define the, the term efficacy because I think we use it a lot. And he runs a thing called the EdTech Efficacy Institute. So I assume he knows what it is. And he gave us an incredibly long definition. But the definition in really simple practical terms was um, the, the outcomes on learners from a product implemented the way it was designed to be implemented, which at the time I thought was a bit of a cop-out. And he gave a nicer narrative of it, which is if you went to the doctor and the doctor said, I think you've got this problem, you need to take these pills and you need to take them once every day for seven days, but you go home and Google and think that you should take four on the first day and three on the seventh day and you die, 
is the product that got bad efficacy, right? Was, was the problem in the production of the tablet? Was it in the prescription? Was it in the pharmacist who delivered it? Was it in the doctor who diagnosed it? And it, it gives a good um, illustration of, you know, edtech products can only be measured in the context that they were designed to be deployed and also with the users that you decide to deploy them with. Which brings me back to you as a final question, I think, Herc, which is, um, has something changed in the way that you approach efficacy or maybe university academic research engagement? The answer could be no. <laughs> <laughs> I, I think the, the Margaret correctly pointed out that it's a spectrum. And there's companies that are at different uh, spots on that spectrum. For us, we're probably looking for something very specific. Um, and it's probably a bit more involved than would fall in the scope of this project. So I think the ambitions of a project like this are aligned. But I think coming back to resourcing, that's where there's probably a gap to, to be filled. Because from an efficacy perspective, to really prove things out takes quite a bit of research and quite a bit of rigor and you know people to, to people to be there and put the hours in and that has to come from somewhere and and yeah, that's that's probably where i think there's a gap in especially in the market because i don't the stuff that you guys pitched uh early on before the project had started was really exciting and I think that was the stuff that we got really excited about because there's enormous value from that beyond the the capital that was involved in the in the in the project. That level of help and efficacy and determining and having someone on your side to do that would actually be a game changer because that level of efficacy doesn't exist in the market in any products that that are sort of at this stage. It's it's you know you don't see it very much. In EdTech, it doesn't exist at all. A question, I guess, a similar sort of question, but leading on. If you wanted to add something to that, happy for it. And But I, I want to go to the second piece as well, which is what would you change now, six to nine months on? Because it feels like, well, we keep talking about six months, but it's longer than six months, right? We, we were involved in this at least nine to 12 months ago so in the design of this program. Yeah, I think the sprints started in late January Sounds from right. memory. Yeah, some of them a bit earlier, some of them a bit later. Some about March as so, well, but <laughs> well, <laughs> unique cases. Um, so <laughs> I think that, um, I think that, again, <clears throat> the point you're making, uh, it, it is quite, I, I don't think it is one size fits all yep. with respect and I've already forgotten the question, and now I'm going back to, to Hart's point, yeah. I can tell you, but I'll finish this thought, which is that for so, in some instances, and it was clear when I read all the sprint reports, the sum that you could measure, to use that term, measure efficacy, because you're after, actually after something quite specific that was measurable. Some products don't operate in a measurable space, and they're never going to be able to necessarily achieve that depending on what you're trying to trying to grasp so I think is that there, 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 we do have to when we think about that sort of higher level of what you're talking about and evidence that may work for some place things are not for others and again I don't think it's one size fits all and you asked what would you change what would I change oh so many things okay so I think that one of the things that happened was if you saw the timeline that David put in is that we we pitched to be academic leads and you pitched at the same time is that right David did we they I don't it sounds right sounds right we sort of do things concurrently so concurrently no waterfall project management so so um <laughs> so i think there was a mismatch of expectations that 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 would definitely um be a first the first thing to change i think we managed that really well and thank you to all the companies because i think you all power to your arm you really saw what was on offer and absolutely ran with it and i think everyone that the evidence of the value of that has been clear from today but I definitely would change that. I think um, uh, um, I think throwing things in the mix, I think definitely keep. I, I'm querying 
and I haven't come to any decision having heard today about the reporting requirements. On the one hand, I would have said, having listened to a bit, that there might have been too much. But I've also heard from today that people got a lot of value from it. So it's, it's kind of like um, maybe to make it clearer and simpler, but probably keep the amount is probably where I'm thinking in terms of what people had to do to report, report back. Um, so those are minor things that I would change. Overall, I think the key issues of the, the simple model, the simple PF model, the partnership um, model with the research mentors, edu growth coming in and supporting back so that keeping people on track as an entirely separate process to doing the research, so the mentors only had to mentor, they didn't have to be police people as well too, um, was also useful. Dom, you have your hand up. Well, one thing I would um, suggest is to give everyone an John. intern. Oh, that's a brilliant idea. <laughs> what was the point? Can I, can I, can I, I missed I that. Know. Everyone should have a data analyst intern. I think every school and every university in Australia uh, uh, wants the same look, thing. So. If, if, I had, if, if it wasn't so complex, and this would be complex, but I think it would be a brilliant idea to actually engage something like this with, with students, to, tertiary students, to have, you know, master students or, you know, I, exactly oh, intern students come yeah. on and do some work, which is exactly what you're suggesting, Dom, because that is your business. Yeah. So maybe, well, maybe not, right? it could be a quadruple helix model. All right, before we sell Dom some more money, give you the same opportunity, what would you change, Herc? Uh, I, I think um, we were asking for this for a long time, but just government support with uh, companies from this, you know, Australian companies and helping them grow internationally. And I think... Um, the big value add is just capital behind them to help push them uh, go further. So that part we love. I think it's just the corpus of capital behind it that, that would make an enormous difference to the scale of what we could do. And it would be so well aligned to, to so many things. And then uh, the researcher component, I mean, a greater investment there would have an enormous impact because it would create barriers for for us to take defensibility globally um and and that's something that you know a lot of companies are short on because it's a, a longer term investment and um often there's a, a gap in knowledge there as well that can be filled by expertise in in this awesome thank uh join me in thanking marg and herc for their contribution thank you get rid of one of my mics so you don't hear me through three ch channels and create f feedback and reverberation. And let me check my, uh, my uh, run sheet here. And yes, I'm, I'm on track and we're a, a little bit ahead. I think I now have control of this. Yes, we do. So um, my, my objective or my obligation today was to try and summarise what a next step might look like and what is possible and what's probable and the things that we're thinking about. There was an interesting component of this project is recently one of the lead researchers actually interviewed me and we spent, I think we were officially supposed to have 45 minutes, so a couple of hours later we wrapped up where we went talking down all sorts of things and it, it made me pause and think about some things. And one of the, the questions that the researchers were asking me is, um, Whilst we've been talking, this as being a six to 12 month process, it's probably been 20 years for me personally. I've done this commercially many times over my career. Um, and at the four or five years I've been at EduGrowth now, it's been the core part of what I've been trying to achieve, which is to build connection, collaboration and acceleration. And this project embodies that. And I'm about to share with you a bit of messy thinking. It's a bit of thinking about where edu growth might be moving over the next couple of years and what we think is an opportunity for uh, all of these people in the room, all of the stakeholders, the government actors, the researchers, the institutions, the education providers and the edtech entrepreneurs. And 
we are thinking broadly about these idea of education sector networks, innovation networks, where we've got the key players of their tech companies who are bringing capital and are bringing ideas and wanting to solve a problem, along with the university and the academics who bring rigour in the way that you approach these things and the things that you think about and the way that knowledge and information and ideas are created. And the education providers themselves, the schools, the universities, the TAFEs, the workforce providers. And we envisage this model of connecting them into a more rigorous and structured framework over a period of time. Um, <clears throat> loosely referring to this as collaboration through action. So anybody who's spent any time in any sort of partnership role, whether it's within a commercial entity or a other institution, there's always this idea that we should partner, we should do something together. And if you looked in my inbox over the last five years, you will see hundreds of messages of people coming to me saying, hey, we should do something. And then what that really means is, can you go away and think about how I can make money from the work that you do so that we can advance our organisation, which is a part of Edugrowth's role. But I'm thinking deeply about how do you build an action framework, how do you build a model that actually allows people to see their role within that innovation network and that ecosystem and how it drives and how it moves forward. And we've talked about this a fair few times throughout the day, which is testbed activation. And someone in the last couple of sessions has said, is this unique? I think this version of the innovation network is unique. I think the way we've approached it is unique. But it's not new. It's not unique. It's not the only one that exists in the world. You see some leading ecosystems around the world. And I'm, I'm reticent to say it, but if we think about Finland as an example for a moment, which seems to be fated as this great education community with fantastic results in one domain on a PISA study. And you know, let's not, we won't debate that one. We'll have a drink later, Michael, and you talk about whether or not that actually is it. But one of the unique characteristics of Finland is that there's a thing called the Helsinki Education Testbed. It's about a $60 million per annum um, program. It funds X number of edtech companies to deploy their product in partnership with schools. It's only indicated the 12 school market. So these models exist. There's the University Innovation Alliance in the, UK, in the US, which is about $50 million worth of funding on an annual basis. Where's all my Global Vic people when we keep talking about the numbers that we need to deploy these things? You're seeing there's an entity in Singapore called InnoLab, which is connected to one of the universities. I can't remember which one it is, which is specifically focused only on the workforce space. And they're um, deploying about $200 million per annum to build these models. So the models exist. We can borrow them. We don't need to start from scratch. I think the EdTech Innovation Alliance program that we've delivered in 2021-22 has been a great way of showcasing the capability and what's possible. Um, here we go, here's the components of it. So it's a known model, it borrows from existing ex uh, programs, there's defined actions, so we'll provide a series of actions for participants to select from, because as soon as you start thinking, how do we partner, well, we'll give you some options. We'll drive some thought leadership and we'll build this brand halo that I've talked about this morning as well. So it might look something like this, where you have a range of edtech companies. In this instance, we had 10. A range of education providers. In this instance, we had 27. And a range of researchers and academics. In this instance, we had 11. So the models can be applied to other ways. And it might be engagements like a voice of customer, where we're helping really early stage edtech companies. I met a really early stage edtech founder this morning or in one of the breaks, you know, where you can go and get your product and go and talk to educators about what does it mean for your product in market? What's the language I need to use? How do we go and do that? You then might go into a proof of concept where you have a structured three to six month pilot program. And I would, I would be urging at the smaller end than the longer end. And then you can start moving into much broader, bigger efficacy analysis and trials. And you're starting to look at how do you actually build these models like Cadmus are ready for, right? So how do you do these things? This is what an engagement across a year might look like. It might be a working group. There may be an okay every quarter. There might be a voice of customer session. There might be some mentoring. There could be a proof of concept that people uh, put in an expression of interest to participate in. And then if, essentially at some point there could be pilot programs and uh, efficacy research programs. So um, this is 
definitely where we're thinking. And this is how the actors in the groups might connect, whether they're tech startups, scale ups, or established companies, the education providers, or the academics, and what they might do in each of these programs. The framework's still got to be built out, but it's the EdTech Innovation Alliance that was funded by Global Victoria in this first iteration has driven forward this thinking. It's, it's a core part of what EduGrowth wants to do, how we want to achieve the acceleration of the Australian EdTech ecosystem. I mentioned it this morning and I'll say it again. The Victorian government have been an incredible partner to the entire Australian EdTech ecosystem, not just Victoria. Because the work that they help EduGrowth deliver in, in Victoria actually, firstly, is not restricted to Victorian companies, but secondly, it drives our thinking and it drives our programs and capabilities to deliver those into other states. So when you think about what's possible and what's probable, it's only through this range of actors that you actually drive this innovation. It's not one entity on, on their own won't be able to achieve these things. And we keep talking about the size of the Australian ethic ecosystem, right? There are 600 companies in Australia today. Well, actually, that's not true. That's June 2020. We're about to do the June 2022 analysis right now. We're in, in fact, we're doing it. Um, they employ 13,000 people. They generate $2.2 billion worth of um, revenue. $600 million of that is offshore. So it's an export market that exists today. It's not one that we need to develop. And it's one in which we are actually taking Australian um, capability offshore. So as if we fund these things in bigger numbers and we drive frameworks, we find a place for all of these actors to actually participate in, I think we'll see an acceleration of the entire space. So to that end, um, I will ask your indulgence for just a moment as I give you, um, as we wrap up. So this brings the Global Victoria EdTech Innovation Alliance Symposium to an end. The program has, only, has been a watershed moment for the Victorian EdTech ecosystem. We've connected nine EdTech companies with 27 education providers from 13 countries, supported by 11 researchers from two world-leading universities to impact 4,110 learners across the globe. And it's not a simple process. So before we be, be, begin drinks, allow me to thank a few people and acknowledge the teams that have been important to produce this outcome. Thanks to the Global Victoria team that supported the vision underlying the program. We could not have delivered this project without your support and partnership. The program couldn't have achieved the big outcomes without strong strategic focus, thanks to the program governance group led by Emeritus Professor Beverly Oliver, including Evan Clark, an EdTech entrepreneur, Margaret Beerman and Michael Henderson as researchers, Carolyn Hartnett representing the Victorian government, and myself representing the industry voice. Each month, this group asked us and the entire EduGrowth team and through them, all of our sprint team, some big questions. Were we delivering the things that we promised? Were we delivering the things that we designed out to do? Um, to each of the EdTech companies, the founders, the executives, and most importantly, the actual people who did the work, which many of you have both heard from today, no, no disrespect, Herc or Colin or Dom, who, have, who are founders of their business, right? Um, maybe you did some of the work as well, but uh, those actual people who got on the ground and worked with your education partners, those who actually jumped to a project a couple of weeks in and went, wow, we've got some money, we've got to do some stuff, what's that stuff going to look like? It has been no easy task. To the lead researchers from Deakin and Monash, Margaret, Philip and Michael, and all the research mentors, we truly appreciate the intellectual weight that you brought to this program. You added a component that we thought we thought about, and then it fell into we didn't know we didn't know. So thank you very much. And finally, to the EduGrowth team, it would not be possible to deliver this program. And someone asked me a question which I always love at these events, which is, how big is your team? feels like you do so much, and we do. We have uh, seven or eight of us spread across Sydney regional areas. I know there's more than that um, spread across regional areas and Melbourne as well. So um, to all of those people who work constantly to make this happen, thank you very much. To all those people who have joined us online today and we've had a hundred, few hundred rotate throughout the day, thank you for participating in the program. And to all of you here in the room, I think the bar is being set up and we're going to get going. So thank you all for being here.